OCB AM. With Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Okay, it's bang at half past seven. It's Tuesday morning. You're welcome along to OTB AM. It's Jerry Gilroy and Owen Sheehan with you all the way through until 10. If you want to get in touch, 0879 180 180 is the WhatsApp number. An incredibly busy show for you this morning, which is going to take in essentially the entire world of sport and everything that's going on. But uh, do we start in Kerry or do we start with Manchester United, Owen? It's up to you. Take your pick. Toss a coin. Let's start with... They're the same thing, really, aren't aren't they? Let's, it's, it's... Uh, let's start with Khabib and then get to Kerry. Yeah. Is that the the order of um, global? Maybe we should start with Kerry. All everything's local, right? Yeah, all all, all news is local. Yeah, let's 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 just uh, get the ball rolling on this one first of all, because I guess we brought uh, reports to you yesterday and information to you yesterday about uh, the recruitment process for the manager. You can go back onto otbsports.com uh, to to have a look at it if you want. And basically, uh, last night was the, the the meeting where Jack O'Connor was. Uh, ratified essentially as as Kerry manager uh, himself and his management team of Mike Quirk and Dermot Murphy and uh, I'm sure this will all be kind of forgotten about in a little while but Tim Murphy the chairman has has come out and, and hit back at reports including our own and he said that it's disheartening to hear the media reports that uh, the recruitment process had already been decided before the interviews. He says uh, the suggestion about it being a done deal going back three or four weeks ago is, is totally erroneous, totally untrue and totally unfounded. I find it very disheartening and very disconcerting that people would actually believe that five people of the integrity and character that were on that selection committee would in any way sully the reputation of Kerry in any form or fashion. I think it's disgraceful. It's the lowest of the low. Then uh, in uh, reading from a prepared statement, uh, he said that he like he talked about the, the sequence that led to O'Connor's appointment and he said he went into more detail than normal in order to completely clarify matters for tonight's meeting and to counter any false or misleading information that appears to have been circulating over recent days. Uh, that is essentially the thrust of what he's saying. So he has rejected uh, any notion whatsoever that uh, this was a uh, fait accompli, uh, that Jack O'Connor was the boss before the recruitment process started. And he also went on to very sincerely thank Peter Keane at the very end of the process um, so all's well that ends well I, I on, a, on a surface level it will be I'm, I'm not I'm not sure it will like the other thing to mention from last night is that there was a defence of Peter Keane and of of Peter Keane I think it's, and in fairness of Stephen Stack actually I should say last night uh, you had the Lestrade Club you had the St Mary's Club in Cara Savine both very connected to, to Peter Keane and then you had Listole Emmets connected with Stephen Stack both raising concerns about the recruitment process. So, in fairness, in fairness now, I wasn't uh, at this on, on Zoom last night, uh, but from what I'm reading this morning, everybody had their say. The, the, the clubs connected with the people who feel they've been wronged by what happened over the last little while uh, have had their say and um, and they've been heard and Tim Murphy has had his say, which is important as well, and the county board have hit back and it's you'd like to think now it, it is all out in the open. All's well that ends well. I I'm, I don't I never buy that personally. I never uh, think that uh, the outcome tells the entire story. I think that uh, you should be analysing the decisions and how the decisions are being made rather than the outcome. I think the outcome is well, can the, sometimes I, over the cracks. The only thing is, the truth is that in ultimately at this level, no one cares about this in six months' time if Kerry True. have the All Ireland. Yeah, no, I, 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 however I agree long it takes, whenever the whatever whatever the next season season is going to be, and we'll get into that in a couple of minutes' time. The truth is, no one cares. They want the All Ireland. I agree. I I totally agree with that. And uh, like we not, we didn't uh, bring bring that story to light yesterday because we thought people cared a lot about it, or that anybody would care about it in a while. We we brought it because we we know our our sources were good on on the story, and uh, we thought it was relatively important in the context of what happened over the last couple of weeks. But you're right this sort of stuff does die down very, very quickly. People will forget about this very quickly. And it, it's not just when it comes to this county. You can look at all the other counties that we've we've done stories on over the, the past couple of years. You look at Mayo, for example, and, and it often feels that when Mayo are going well, everybody forgets about some of the things that happened at county board level. And I'm, I'm not talking about the current county board. I'm talking about previous county boards. The same goes for Galway. Um, and I'm sure even with Clare, for example, if they'd gone on a, a great run, in the hurling championship this year, everybody would even like, what was that story again uh, in pre-season? What was that centre of excellence thing about? People forget about this stuff when the team on the on the field is doing well. 
Now, in fairness, it's in the interest of the county board for the team to be doing well. So it's in their interest for the process to be done well as well. So, uh, look, I, I think that it's it's good that everybody's had their say at this point and, and hopefully people can make their own mind up from, from everything that's out there at the moment. All right. Somebody else who had a say overnight is uh, Alex Ferguson, who has been having a chat with his buddy, Khabib Nurmagomedov. I did not know they were friends, but we do now. The whole world knows they're friends now because there was a hot mic when they were having a chat. Um, Khabib put it up helpfully on his Instagram where you can clearly hear Ferguson uh, and the two of them are just having a chat. I don't know where it is, actually. Um, it's obviously somewhere in England because I don't think Ferguson has, has travelled to um, uh, the uh, to Eastern Europe. I, I also think that they saw Ronaldo wasn't playing, says Ferguson. And uh, they're chatting away. And then Khabib goes, yeah, but he came on in the second half. I know, but you should always start your best players. That's <laughs> Ferguson. Uh, yeah, the, like, the, the, this... Who filmed this? Was this the, the Manchester United official team? Was that? Am I right in saying that? Like, if it's if it's that, um, it's on Khabib's Instagram. Yeah, like it's like so. United at United District posted a Twitter via Mirror Football. Sorry, yeah, sorry. It's uh, Khabib's Instagram. So it's one of uh, Khabib's friends or uh, family. Khabib members. quickly changes the subject after <laughs> Solskjaer gets thrown under the bus. Oh, how's your How's your health? Good now. Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. Ollie out. Ali out is he, Khabib it, it essentially is uh, the antithesis of the two kids who went up on MUTV the other day and said Ali out uh, at at the end of their piece. Uh, it's <laughs> it's interesting. It's a little bit of an interesting insight into maybe Ferguson's mindset. Like Daniel Harris made this point on the show yesterday that like I wonder even if you take into account all the fitness issues that come with being a thirty six year old do you actually take into account that it's the last game before the international break and say screw it let's absolutely sweat the asset for as long as we can on the final game before the international break and let Portugal deal with that problem would Ferguson have done something like that? Probably would Ferguson would have hoped that he got injured in the, he would have played him to the 97th minute tr- try to get him like a little cast rain or a little just a little twinge in his ass so he can go oh, oh you can't go now you can't go you're going to have to sit there lie on the couch and rest for the next two weeks so that when you come back you're in amazing form that's what happened Yeah, you've already qualified from that group I saw those two goals you scored against Ireland that's the end of that group <laughs> uh, and like also uh, a bit of an insight into how he would, would view kind of even the, the, the presence of a, of a player on the pitch I think the, the subtext is Ferguson saying that you can actually scare a team coming to Old Trafford just by having Ronaldo on the pitch or, or your best player on the pitch I'm, I'm not even sure he's making the point that uh, he would have scored a goal it's just the fact that Ronaldo's on, on the field against you. Well, you did look at the team sheet and go, right, okay. They're still picking that guy to start games. Okay, so in fairness, Marcel scores, but um, even at that point, it's like, well, that guy scored against us. We we're definitely going to have to come back from this. Hmm. I don't know. It did feel like, and it doesn't, it, it doesn't help Solskjaer that Ferguson is doing this stuff, but I think he's just saying what a lot of people were thinking. And it's not like it's, he, he's actually throwing one of the bus the, the um, tabloids are still going mad about the fact that uh, Ronaldo stormed down the uh, tunnel at the weekend is that is that actually as big a deal I mean the psychodrama that is these greatest players in the world every single bit is parsed over and that is the soap opera and is Solskjaer a big enough manager to take that I don't know. I, I, I want to believe that it's all to do with the Townsend celebration. And I kind of love how Andros Townsend uh, kind of believed that it was to do with his celebration. I think it is too, though. You, you think it is to do with the celebration? It's more, it's more like that, that or the fact they didn't win. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I would say it's more to do with the fact that they didn't win. I, I, I like At the start, it kind of felt like it was Townsend because like even just watching it on match of the day again on Saturday night the kind of sequence of events is Townsend celebration which he absolutely slaughters by the way like if you're going to imitate a, a celebration not easy it's not an easy that's the thing I, I think he proved that actually if he wanted to do a Ronaldo celebration like doing the Robbie Keane celebration would be easier than doing the Ronaldo celebration it turns out that eye-hand coordination does not come easy but you just see that quickly and then you, the match finishes up quickly and then you've got Townsend talking and then you've got the pictures and it all kind of comes together as one little story where it's like he's definitely annoyed with Townsend but then the more time goes on it's kind of like I'm not sure uh, but you have to say that the Townsend um, excuse that it was a tribute to one of his favourite players is is very very funny uh, like <laughs> how many people do like 
it wasn't a tribute to one of his favourite players. It was it was a, an absolutely exceptional moment of trolling from Andras Townsend. And then, then he should have owned that. Yeah, no. exactly. I, I think he should. That's what I'm saying. I think like nobody like all time legend in the Everton fans. If he comes out and goes, yeah, I was just trolling him. <laughs> Because uh, I, I think that's what he was doing, and then but then to have the cheek to go up and ask for the jersey afterwards is um, <clears throat> is next level trolling. Then if that's what he was trying to do, so I I think the the bottom line is that actually the the, the main reason why Ronaldo's not happy is that they haven't won. It feels like a defeat. They probably should have lost the game actually. If um, if, if Mina's just not that extra yard forward, or if, or if Davis just shoots himself and buries it himself, and then it's then it's game over. Yeah. And I, I think it feels like a defeat. And I think that if United win the game and Townsend scores like a consolation goal and still does that celebration, Ronaldo's not reacting like that. So the genesis of Ronaldo's re- reaction is Manchester United not getting three points at home to Everton. <laughs> what about Ferguson? What difference does this make? Because again, there's no news, right? There's no football news coming out from Manchester United for the next four or five days. And the last things they they have now is Ronaldo angry about something. We don't know exactly what, but certainly there's room for speculation. And we now have Lord Protector of Solskjaer, his booster in chief, throwing him under the bus a little bit, criticizing him openly to, you know, a celebrity fan, which is like, is it a bit galling? It's like, could you just not like say, oh, all he's doing a great job, you know, sensational. Like I, I always think though, when you look at the material impact of what something like this will have on maybe the Manchester United hierarchy, I, I think this just plays in beautifully. Like, like, say if you're a Glazer watching this from Tampa or wherever they're based. Are they based in Tampa? I presume they are. Wherever you're watching I don't it think from. they're based in Tampa. Uh, I think they just own, uh, own, they own, own a, property uh, in Tampa. Yeah. Um, somewhere nice, somewhere sunny. You're like, this is perfect. The, the, this, uh, uh, the way everything has gone throughout the Solskjaer era it has just fallen into place perfectly for them the results have been this was at the game this was at the game on yeah. Saturday yeah it was at Old Trafford yeah I, like, I, I get that I get that but the conversation and then any bit of com- any bit of controversy around Manchester United so far this season has totally been about the football side of things it's been about Solskjaer it's been about a former manager potentially throwing him under the bus and I think that if you're in charge of a club that had seen protests at the end of last season where fans had actually infiltrated the pitch to protest against you as the owner of the football club You want them protesting against somebody else But exactly Now, you now you've got this beautiful little soap opera going on uh, between a former manager and a current manager uh, this talk of Ronaldo being annoyed with the celebration or is he annoyed with Solskjaer uh, of course, this happens in the middle of a football season where people focus on the football. That, that is obviously natural. But Manchester United, as things stand, are going to finish in the top four, possibly comfortably. That This top four will probably separate itself from the other 16 teams as the season goes on. And that's kind of all you want as an owner of a club. Sure, ideally, you would take a trophy. But Manchester United are going to be a Champions League club once again. People are not going to be talking about the Glazers because what you've got is this very interesting situation now where Solskjaer, as you as you put it, is always there's always a referendum about him after every single game that they play. There's a boom bust cycle within Solskjaer, and that is perfect for the new cycle to keep their eyes away from the ownership and the fans away uh, from the ownership. Yes, they'll wear their their green and gold scarves, but uh, this this high point of, of of heat against the Glazers seems to have been dimmed down a little bit because people are kind of like the football thing is interesting enough. I do, I do like the parallels with the American football team and the just the experience that they have of success with that group. Now, obviously, they've bought a bunch of aging superstars there, and they've bought a bunch of aging superstars in, in Ronaldo, certainly one, and you could argue Cavani is uh, fairly similar to that. Um, so there's a some weird model going on, but it was successful. They they won the Super Bowl last year and so I, surely surely when you're that rich mm. and your debt is being managed really well and you're taking out the money there's there are bits along the way where you want you want the little morsel of success you want the adulation like when you win the Super Bowl you go on the pitch you get the trophy you're the person who is given that not the team head coach not the quarterback not the MVP in the game like it's not like the the Champions League will be lifted by the Manchester United captain. Uh, in their heads, they'll be lifting that. They'll certainly be down in the dressing room afterwards if they win the Champions League, lifting the trophy and getting the trophy and bringing the trophy around, going, we won this with our money. Well, that's how they feel about it. So I don't buy that. It, it's, you know, obviously from a business perspective, you've got to make your business decisions and you've got to make sure that you get to a point where... Um, where you continue to be in the Champions League every year. They're, it doesn't feel like they're at risk at that. I mean, if, if 
if things go completely tits up in the next six weeks and they, they're out of the Champions League and looks like they're not going to be in the top four, then I suspect that we will end up with um, with a, a change of, of management. But 100%. I do also feel like there's a point where they go, OK, it'd be nice to be competitive, it'd be nice to be in the Champions League quarterfinals and the semifinals mm. because we've put enough money in our wage bill is enough for us to think that we can get there and everybody else seems to be able to get there. Well, and, and that's the that's the key thing because I know like this parallel comes up an awful lot about what the end of the Wenger era at Arsenal looked like and it seemed that they were just very, very happy to kind of take a step back and allow the team to go fourth, 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 fourth third, maybe second, maybe push for a title, fourth. And, and like that was just a perfect business model. But the key difference is that the owners at that point weren't necessarily pumping money into the club. It was it was a, a beautiful business model, a, as stable a business model as you can possibly hope for in football. Whereas with Manchester United, you've you're paying Ronaldo's wages. You've got Rafael Varane into the club. You are investing something in this for the sake of of success. And I guess if you look around at, at other football owners, certainly with the likes of of Manchester City and Paris Saint Germain, there is a big owner presence. There is a big owner ownership sort of. There's a situation where the owners like to take a bit of credit for this. Not on the level of American football, where the owner is literally presented with the trophy, but it is going that way, where where the owners are becoming more and more prominent and more and more credited for their success. So, yeah, I think I think there's probably some truth in what you're saying, but it is a business at the end of the day, and this is a business that's caused them a bit of PR damage earlier this year. And right now, people aren't really talking about them. People are talking about the, the footballing decisions uh, at, at the club. But I agree, if it looks like they're not going to get Champions League next season, I think that's where, where Solskjaer is in, in trouble. All right, it is 7.46 this morning. We have been uh, covering the imminent decision that's going to be made at Congress in great detail over the last week or so. We've spoken with managers and we've spoken with players and we've spoken with a bunch of people and uh, we'll hear later on this week from the, the GPA and the show as well um, in favour essentially of option B. We, we've been looking around for people to talk to us about option A and also perhaps um, neither of these options going forward and uh, to that end I'm delighted to say we've got Brian McAvoy who is the Provincial Director and CEO of Ultra GA with us this morning. Brian, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. All good. Yes, thank you. So listen, um, this is obviously a, a big moment for the future of Gaelic football. We've, we've been talking about fixture um, review and fixture task forces. Essentially since the qualifiers came in. When they came in, it was like, oh, this is going to be a staging post and we'll get somewhere else. But uh, it never really happened and there's been very staunch debates. So can I just ask where you guys stand at the moment on the current proposals that are on the table and what kind of debates are happening uh, with the people that you're speaking to? Yeah, well, uh, in relation to the ongoing debate, uh, I don't think we have any uh, engagement. We will have some engagement with our counties uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, yesterday, the, the, the official motions were, were, were circulated yesterday, even though we, we've had them since February, uh, when they were on the trial for the previous Congress, but weren't actually taken. Um, there has been an explanatory session, which uh, the Archdewer and the Uptra and, and Fergal McGill have conducted with each of the four provinces, uh, and the counties in those provinces and their, their overseas twin partners. But that was just basically uh, explanatory. It didn't really get into the pros and cons, uh, the merits or demerits uh, of each of the motions. So those debates are now happening across each county. Uh, and uh, in relation to where we used to stand as a provincial council, um, you know, we, we, we do recognise that uh, the, the current system uh, does need to be uh, looked at and that you know, there are certain things, particularly within the provincial system, that aren't really working. But we don't feel that either of the two motions on the agenda uh, address that. And if you're going to have change, you have to try to get change, which will make things better. Uh, in both scenarios, we feel the motions that have been presented by the, uh, the task force um, don't do that. One of the motions is slightly better than the other one. I think motion A is the better of the two motions. I think motion B um, which is the one where a, a lot of uh, there have been most discussion around and some um, support. What I can see, I feel that it has absolutely nothing in it to offer. Uh, what it does is that it uh, totally uh, it removes the provincial championships from uh, it divorces them from the All Ireland series. We have seen with the Ulster hurling championship. The DNR that the Ulster Hurling Championship was divorced from the All Ireland series 
was the day that it died. They will become pre-season competitions, effectively. You are the, the Alliance League. Can we chat about these along the way, Brian? Because they're, they're complex okay, enough issues. Fine, so just fine, okay, on, on okay, the fine. on the Ulster Hurling Championship um, comparison, there wasn't really a long tradition of the Ulster Hurling Championship. There was no Ulster Hurling Championship in the 70s and 80s, until the late 80s, until Down came along and then Antrim would play Down and automatically qualify for an Ireland yeah. uh, quarterfinal sometimes. Because I remember they played Kildare in a, when Kildare were the All-Ireland B champions, I think in 87 or 88, maybe before, around that period of time. And... and to compare the Ulster Hurling Championship with the Ulster Football Championship, say it feels a little bit like comparing apples and oranges, given just how important the Ulster Football Championship has been to the Ulster Counties for the best part of a century. I take your point, but what you have to also remember is when in 1989 the Ulster uh, Championship was uh, reformed, um, that year actually we saw Antrim get to an All Ireland final. Throughout the 1990s, we had Down challenging, we had Derry challenging throughout the 90s and noughties. So the standard had improved because they knew that they were getting into a, an All-Ireland quarterfinal. And that, that actually had the standard within the province. Uh, the day that was divorced, we returned to those 1970s days that you just talked about. So while you may say it may be comparing apples with oranges, it's not quite as simple as that. But the, the standard according within the province improved when we had an Ulster Championship and when the winners were going on to the All-Ireland Series. That's can I just make good. a... Sorry, Brian, just on that. The, like the thing about the, the hurling comparison is that Ulster was treated differently in that case, to Munster and Leinster. There is nothing that will treat Ulster differently in this scenario to any of the other provinces. All four of the provinces will be treated the same. In what respect? In the fact that the entire system will be the same for everybody. The Ulster Championship... Oh, yeah, oh, got... I, 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 I get that, I get that, but I'm just making a scenario in relation to divorcing the provincial championships from the All-Ireland series the provincial challenges themselves basically lose their value. Okay, that's the point I'm just making. And, that and, would apply and, uh, and, to, to Proposal B, okay. uh, to a lesser extent to Proposal A, because well, you know, Proposal A, every team does get a chance to win their own provincial title. So it really prefers Proposal B. And in just the main time. on the point about there being a devaluation of the competition, you know, if if in the real environment, if this um, trial was run, say, for a couple of years, I think what's going to happen is that um, the Gaelic football fan is going to be starved of inter-county action. So everybody goes back to their clubs and the club scene gets the, the priority it deserves for a couple of months between, kind of, say, August, September, October, and then we get into the um, provincial club and the All-Ireland club before Christmas. And then, so essentially it's going to be before the All-Ireland final, midsummer, all the way through to the following springtime. And then you have these round robin home and away games in the provinces for a trophy I don't really see that it's devalued if there's actually a meaningful trophy at the end of it and particularly in Ulster I would have felt like you know the, they, beco- for- they, bec- they become they become glorified pre-season competitions it totally devalues to try and suggest otherwise you're not really living in the real world it is devalued full stop Okay, that is is that the, the main thing for you that that's- no that's not one thing <laughs> the other thing you're also devaluing the leagues to a lesser extent. But we have actually have quite a good league competition at the minute. People say our four eights are very good. If you adopt proposal B, you're devaluing the leagues as well. You're doing away with league finals. You don't have them anymore. Uh, you're having a situation uh, whereby a team could have a bad start to the league. De facto, they see their season is over because they cannot, particularly if they're maybe Division 2 uh, or Division 3, uh, certainly, certainly Division 2, if they feel that we can't get to the top three after they lose the first two or three games, that's, that becomes meaningless. Uh, they will lose some of it, but as you can say, maybe they're fighting to stay stay, stay, stay in the league. Um, yeah, I get that. But effectively, it is, you, you have games which effectively become meaningless towards the end of the league. And we've seen with the Super 8s, you know, even in three rounds, you can have dead rubbers. You know, in the last round, for example, two of the games, like the Tyrone, Dublin, Cork, Ross, Common game, the last series were dead rubbers. So you're devaluing the leagues. You're doing away with with with, with league finals. <laughs> you know. So what you've done? So first thing, you've ruined the provincial championships, and secondly, you've devalued the leagues. So you know, there's two great reasons that no one has really come out and explained those and and debated about those. So there's what proposal B goes straight away. Also, in relation to you talked about matches, under the current system, uh, and so in twenty in twenty nineteen. 
once the provincial championships were finished, there were 39 games um, in qualifying and round robin and getting to all Ireland finals. Under this scenario, once the league championship system is over, you get nine. You get nine knockout championship games and you get 14 touching cup games. But that's what you got. So you are totally taking away the prime knockout games at the best time, well, you know, basically during uh, June, July, basically. You're reducing it to nine knockout games. Now, has anyone really thought this through? I think a lot of people have thought it through, Brian, because you're actually multiplying the number of games that the teams in Division 2, 3 and 4 will get in summertime. The point about yeah. the value in the leagues, I'm not really sure I understand, when actually if you're a team in Division 2 who loses your first three games, say, suddenly you're clinging on for dear life not to get relegated to Division 3, like, which actually imbues those games with even more meaning rather than less meaning. Because in the league at the moment, if you go down between Division 2 and Division 3, you know, maybe your qualification for the Talton Cup might be impl- uh, impacted on it, but not really yeah. that much. You're still within the opportunity. If you're a Division 2 or Division 3 team, you still believe that you have the opportunity to reach a provincial final, say, and guarantee or, or get promoted the next season and guarantee that you'll be able to play. Well, no, the provincial championships will be over for this stage. Well, not... not no, <laughs> uh, it, all, all, being, all being them having, having, you know, they're basically pre-season competition. No, look, I realise people want to stay in it, but mindset... You know, you've got to get inside and no player goes out to lose a game or no manager goes out to lose a game. But within the player's mindset, he already knows that I, I can't even play in the championship. Well, in, in that respect, but they played in the championship. Not, the first game of the season was a championship match. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's a league championship. It's a league championship. So but it's the Sam Maguire. It's, it's, it's the Sam Maguire. It's diluted, You're playing for the Sam Maguire on the first day. It, it is a championship qualifier. It's a diluted form of championship. But I, um, it isn't, you know, though. It, it's, not, it's not the really <laughs> cut and thrust of, of, of knockout action, you know? Um, so, yeah. But mindset, the player knows that I can no longer win the All Ireland. Uh, you know, at that, if, he, if he's a Division Two player uh, and he's lost his first two or three games, or indeed if he's a Division One game after five or six rounds. How do you feel, uh, Brian, in the current know, scenario? If if you lose your first two or three games, your season is done. Like you don't like you lose your first game, you lose your second game, your season is done. So yeah, yeah, you're but, saying now that they you, lose the first two or three games, so their championship is done. No, you've played you've played your seven league games. Uh, you you then know your championship is coming afterwards. The two of them are now rolled into one. Uh, so, no, it's a totally different situation. Just one other thing that you mentioned there. You said that Proposal A provides everyone with the chance to win their province. It does, yeah. How is that possible when you are going to be moving teams from Ulster into Connacht, moving teams from Leinster into Connacht and Munster? Proposal B because, is the one that allows because, everyone the chance because, to win their province, not Proposal A. Just to, just on a point, just to clarify that, Brian, what you said yeah, there is well, an accurate. Possible no, because really. there, 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 are, there are two provinces affected, Ulster and Leinster. Yes. What will happen yeah. is that if the, the, on the Proposal A, the Alliance Leagues continue uh, as they are at present, okay? And then at the yeah. end of the Alliance Leagues, the two lowest ranking teams play off, okay? The winners of that in Ulster win to the Ulster Championship, the losers went to the Leinster because goes into the Connor Championship. And the same the bottom six teams in Leinster play off the three teams that win went to the Leinster Championship. The three teams that lose go into two goes into the Monster Championship and one goes into the Connor Championship. So there are so provincial every team, round. through yeah through that preliminary round game. Provincial every team preliminary has round a games. To win. Yeah. There is provincial in Limerick in, in Leinster and in Ulster. But there pro- are provincial pro- Proposal B is also a provincial championship for everyone to win. Proposal B has a provincial championship which has no link to the All Ireland series. So the provincial championship, as outlined in Proposal A, is a pre season competition. So it's, it's a link to the championship. But just to clarify, they can, everybody can win their own province in Proposal B, which I thought was your point initially about that, that that was your concern. No. So, so it's a no, link, it's but, a link but, between no, the provinces the, and the All Ireland series. The, the, no, the very first point I made the provincial championships to be meaningful have to have a link to the All Ireland series. In uh, proposal B, that link is taken away. Brian, you obviously have have seen proposals come and go over the years. Has there ever been a proposal that you guys thought this works, or are you actually happy enough, relatively speaking, with the status quo? No, I think at the very outset, I, I said that uh, there is opportunity to uh, change. I think actually, what actually might work is the first part of proposal B. That where you you have the round robins within the provinces, not bringing anyone to uh, another province. So within Ulster, you have a group of five and a group of four, for example. 
in, in Leinster, a group of six and a group of five, but keep those provincial championships linked to the All Ireland series. So actually, the answer is possibly stern us in the face. Have your round robins within your provinces, rather than moving one county from Ulster to Connacht, one county from Leinster to Connacht. I definitely. So definitely. have that. So and keep it and keep it linked to the All Ireland series. That's the, that's, that's the key. It does. Know? It does feel like the whole idea of moving counties from one province to another is is faintly ridiculous, particularly a county who will be coming off a bad league campaign and then a defeat in a preliminary round because how, how well are they realistically going to do their form can't be that that's good the, that's the big weakness in that, in, in that proposal that doesn't make any yeah, sense that's yeah. the, that the big weakness so in that proposal just in yeah. terms okay. in, in terms of, of um, the, the the future and what this might look like and, and how um, it, it seems like you guys feel very strongly about the importance of the provincial championship retaining the link to the exactly and, 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 there's, and there's a third element to this as well what, what I don't want to say because I know uh, you, you're a commentator on last, last week you said on, on, on the task force and his views are, are well gotten well merited and, and genuine about it but the third issue that hasn't really been discussed at all now to me it's not the key issue by any means no well, the key issues are the ones I've just spoke about is the whole finances of it because at the minute you know in 2018 for example uh, sorry, 2019, the last year that, that, that we had the uh, the the, the uh, Super uh, rights. Before, COVID, before COVID, yeah, the last normal season, shall we say, the GA football championships uh, uh, took in 18, 18, just over 18 million, 18.2 million euro, uh, and that's without the provincials, without the provinces. Um, the Alliance leagues took in 3.5 million in those. The league money actually goes back to the counties. Now there has been no debate. To my knowledge, uh, to say like, what would happen to the league championship? How will that money be divided up? Mm. Also, you know, like I talked about the thirty-nine games being reduced to nine plus fourteen uh, Talchon Cups. So I am quite certain the general income for central council, for counties, and of course provincial councils with their championships are are, are been effectively uh, so badly diluted uh, that there will be less money in the central pot. I am quite certain if these proposals go through, proposal B, the overall revenue, the GA in 2019 talked about a record profit year. They'll not be talking about it all to the system. <laughs> if this goes through. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I, I'm surprised that there hasn't actually been any debate on the finances. Well, it's funny. To me, it's, it's akin to Turkey's vote for Christmas. <laughs> you know? Um, that that's really I interesting, know, Brian. Because that, I think that that is the key point, and we're, we've been trying to address it as much as we can. Tony McIntyre brought it up. Actually, I'm I'm very sure that these proposals have been costed, and that projections have been run by the finance various finance committees and various financial officers in Croke Park. So it'll be very interesting to see if those. Well, if you're very sure, you have more information than I have. Well, of course, have of course, they have one shred of evidence. Of course they run them. Every business runs, um, like it, it's budgeting season. So every every business runs budgets. I, I, I'm i interested. Well, in- I think if every business runs them, I think it would be nice if they showed them to the counties before the debate. Have, have you guys the have you guys done a, a cost benefit analysis in, in terms of the finances? Because it's interesting that that's something that, that well, has, I, I has have come done. Up. I haven't done it. As I say, I have seen no cost benefit analysis. But what I do know is you're reducing 39 games to nine. But you're not really. In terms of the knockout series. You're, you're, so, not, you're, um, not, you're not really though, Brian. That, I, I, that's, that's, it's interesting that that's the figure. Under this system, there will be more games for counties guaranteed over the course of the year because there'll be no, no, the no, home, no, there will be, there will be there will be round robin no. provincial games which they'll be able to charge into, and there will be a guarantee of three or four home championship matches. You're calling it league, but it's actually it is the competition to win the Sam Maguire, their championship matches. You know, and and that's actually more games. There will not be more games. We will have no pre-season competitions anymore. There will be no McKenna Cups or Burn Cups. So those round-robin provincial championship games already happened in the pre-seasons. That pre-season is now replaced by a provincial championship. You have every county has league games at the minute. Those league games become uh, league championship games. And then 10 lucky counties, and then the Division 3 and 4 went to Talchon Cup, 10 lucky counties get to play... Knockout 16 in total. Every, uh, so, um, 10 get to play yeah. for the Stamford World Cup. Yeah. Um, and everybody else because it's Talchon Cup. There's 15, 15 players for the Talchon Cup. Yeah. But every county currently gets to play in a knockout competition. So there's actually going to be less game because you've lost your pre-seasons. You have uh, in the Alliance Leagues. Every county gets an Alliance League at the minute. 
plus I say at least at least two championship games. But is it, is it your contention, yeah, Brian, that there would be so smaller be attendances? Sorry, uh, is it your contention that there will be smaller attendances at uh, at matches in in summertime? So let's say Mayo play. Um, who would Mayo play? Let's say Monaghan play Mayo. Are, is there going to be more people in Clonus if that game is played in May or June than there would be if that game is played in February or March? What, what I would say to you is if Monaghan play Mayo in a not out game, uh, there would be more people at it. Well, round five, play. round five of the league could be essentially be a knockout Correct, game. Correct. Yeah. What I'm saying is if people think that round four of the league, the league championship, would attract the same attendance as the same two teams meeting in a preliminary quarterfinal or an All-Ireland quarterfinal together. But, but, that is not going to happen. People are not going it to... Doesn't go have to it doesn't have to attend. That's not, again, that's not like with like. What, 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 what we're saying is that more people will go to these games than will go to the league matches. And actually, more people will go to these games than will go to the league matches and the championship matches combined. I, I actually genuinely believe there is a financial projection Sorry, which, which increases sponsorship which increases your TV rights, which there. increases what your attendance. What, 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 Specifically, the, the, the comparison... People, people, look, what, if, Ra- if, round okay. five of the All-Ireland Championship round next one of the season. League, round one of the Allianz League, Armagh play Dublin, right? Mm-hmm. It will get a decent attendance, OK? Uh, round one of the, the League Championship, Armagh play Dublin, it might get some more, OK? But remember, there's seven rounds of those games. So it will not come anywhere near comparing what Armagh and Dublin would if they were meeting in an in a knockout championship. But so, hang on, hang on, sorry. Armagh and Dublin could still meet in the knockout championship. So round one, they, they meet... Let's, let's just go through that. So round one, they meet Division One, San Maguire Championship, and the game is in Armagh. Big attendance, massive hype, build up for the whole week. It's McGinney versus Desi. It's Nafina versus Nafina. Right? That's that, And so I, I think that's close to a sellout. Right, I I do, but here's the thing: they will. There's a there's a good. Let me finish. Let me let me finish, please. Let, let me finish, because the point you made was that they won't get the same as they would in a knockout game. They can still meet in a knockout game in an All Ireland quarter final or an All Ireland semi final. So it's that game, is the game that you should be comparing like with like. And what we're saying is that that league game will get more than the league game would now because it's far more meaningful. It will get more, but not to the same extent that when you're actually reducing the number of knockout games. 39 to 9. That's the issue. Uh, because when Armagh and, and, and if Armagh and Dublin meet in that, I'm saying it, at a league game, there may be 6,000. At the league championship game, you make it next to 1,000. That's all you get because people are not going to spend money week after week on the seven. They will. Remember, they will. The, the experience the of people all around the world is that they want to go to prices. matches. Just let, me, no, let, me, let me finish my point here. Remember, at the minute you can get a season ticket for 120 euros, you get to a Division 1 game. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen in a league championship game, but it certainly won't be as cheap as 120 euros anyway. The point I'm making is, at the end of all those league championships, you are down to nine games. Previously, you're 39. Okay, that okay, you had the Super 8s in there, so we'll take it away or whatever. But what I'm saying is, there is less chance, or, you know, you've reduced the number of games in that knockout. So I'm a, I might meet Dublin again, but there's 30 odd, you know, there's many other, 20 other games not the games that would have previously taken place that are gone. Don't happen anymore. And don't tell me that the Talchin Cup is good, but it will not be a trending, you know, attracting, uh, attract massive figures. But yeah, except those games will be happening, but not on the same level. So this hasn't been, uh, and quite, you know, uh, you said that the homework has been done. I have seen no evidence of that, and uh, I would like to see it, because I think from looking at those basic facts, the figures don't add up. Brian, you're... Um... I can see I can see where where you're coming from here, and the uh, the knockout element seems to be a central part of of your argument. But what's interesting is that is that we we actually just kind of don't know the answer to that. And we, the only suggestion that we've got at that in recent years is maybe the super eights. And and just like speaking of of the last super eights, Mayo versus Kerry in Killarney got a crowd of up to forty thousand people. I think that game was not knockout. That game was between two teams of a similar standard in a ground that wasn't Croke Park. It was a little bit uh, untraditional, to put it that way, between Mayo and Kerry. People came down in their droves to that game. It was not a knockout game. It was the first game of the group stages. 
the other part of, of your argument seems to be focused on preserving the McKenna Cup, which I understand is somebody involved in Ulster GEA. It's got a much bigger tradition than the McGrath Cup, for example, and I can see no, that. But that, that's, that's not entirely knockout all the way either. Like, you look at the Ulster Championship games, that'll, it'll go from an eight-game championship to a 19-game championship, the Ulster Championship. Like, you talk about Turkey's voting for Christmas here. Surely as somebody involved in, in Ulster GEA, you can see why the inflation of 11 games would actually be good for you and everybody in your province. And a couple, couple of good points there. First of all, the very, very outset, he said, we don't know the answer. And that was in relation to the finances. Yet, counties are being asked to make a vote on the most far-ranging uh, GEA football structure you change ever. I was and sorry, the point I was making, we don't know the answer is who, who will show up to the, the, the non-knockout the games. Question. That's the turkeys vote for Christmas bit. They don't know the answer. You've got that 100% spot on. But I'm saying That's that we did We did get an insight into Super 8s as to what happens when two teams of a similar standard go toe-to-toe no, -to -toe in a game that is not it's knockout. Look, Mayo are great traveling people and that's a one-off game. I've been at Super 8 games. Uh, you know, I was at, and I talked about um, you talked about the Mayo, the, the Mayo um, uh, Kerry game. How many were people in the Super, were at the Super 8 game between Cork and Roscommon? That was a, was that was that the same weekend? Was that a dead rubber? That was at the very end. Both teams were knocked out at that point. Exactly, it was a dead rubber. Yeah, no. and you are going to get and you are going to get lots of dead rubbers. You're really not. Obviously, you're going to get very few part. dead rubbers. There's, the no, there's no relegation. You, know, you, had, you had you had mentioned was the McKenna Cup. The McKenna Cup's a great competition. Now I'm not lovely. If we save it, we save it, and I would get to see it go. But what I'm saying is, you talked about the uh, about the Ulster, the Ulster Championship at the minute in 2019. I think we took in 1.5 million. Uh, from the Ulster Championship. In 2019, we took on 165,000 from the Canada Cup. And what I'm saying is, this league tie championship, a 10, you know, the, 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 sorry, you know, it, it, the Ulster Championship then being replaced as a, as a standalone competition with no, um, with no link to the All Ireland series. The financial figures will be closer to the 165 than they will be to the 1.5 billion. I have no doubt about that. Can I, can, I, can I ask a question, Brian? If the finance question was answered, and uh, and there was a guarantee said that any losses that we make over the three-year trial period will be made up centrally. If that was answered, would you guys be willing to, to experiment for three years to see what happened? If if all the financial questions were answered, would you be willing but to my, forgo the other concerns? It's, it's, it's a good question, but what I'm telling you, from what the facts that I'm looking at, it, the GAA coffers centrally will take a hammering if this goes through. I don't see how that will not be able actually, to make it up simply. Honestly, but I they will take a massive hit. But so one one thing, one aspect of this that hasn't really been part of the conversation is that the current rights deal goes up to the end of the officially the league campaign next year. But I've no doubt that they'd be able to talk to the various broadcasters and say, well, actually, what's going to happen is you're going to have way more games, and we're going to buy you out of that deal, and we're going to start our, our, our new deal next. I've no doubt that the broadcasters would be interested but, in but injecting. You're not going to have one, one, way more games. Well, you will. You, will, you, you absolutely will. You're, not getting, you're, not getting way you're more going to have games. way more games that are, are are interesting. All of a sudden, the games in Division <laughs> I think, Three. I think the Allianz League is very interesting as it is. But they're, no one's going to televise the games in Division Three and Division Four in the Allianz League. Whereas all of a sudden, those games are now meaningful. They're in high summer. There's going to be huge local interest. It's going to be packed stadiums. Whatever, whatever you might say. I think that all of a sudden, a game between and, two uh, Division uh, Three teams where, where a place in an All-Ireland last 16 is on the line it, it is actually going to generate interest in crowds and it's going to uh, um, generate media coverage. I think the value of those rights goes up exponentially because the value of the games are must-see for, for fans and supporters of that team. So I think that like that's a part of the calculation where you can literally go to your broadcast partners and say, we're, we're increasing the, the cost of those rights because... Uh, those games are now more meaningful deeper into the season. Well, there's, there's only so many games you can televise uh, over a weekend. Uh, you, know, you, you have basically. Well, actually, there uh, isn't any more because of because of well, GA no, Go. No, you can televise but, everything. Yeah, but you have that with GA Go. Yeah, we've yeah. seen that with GA Go. So, but there is nothing um, to suggest that any more Division Three, Four Championship games are going to be on, uh, on 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 you know, on television. Um, than, 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 than what happens currently. So no, uh, there will not be more games for broadcasters. I, I think there will. Uh, I, the broadcasters' I, I, games will stay the same. Now, you may be able to see watch games in Division 3 and 4 through GA Go, yeah, but you can do that already. So <laughs> there will not be, you know, this is a fallacy. I think it's going to be bigger these, these are, sponsorship these are, opportunities as well. Out. You're thrown out. Well, but 
you know, you don't know that this can't happen because here's the thing. So many games on television. Well, you, you, you actually can't. You can you can you can bring more broadcasters on. You could definitely have so um, BBC Ulster could show games, RTE could show games, yeah, yeah. Virgin could show well, games, Sky could show our, games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have an arrangement with BBC Ulster. Yeah, but of course you, you do raise an interesting bit that actually you know uh, because the current commercial uh, arrangements you say carry through to the end of the Alliance League. Now, if this proposal, I'm sure it could be overcome. I don't think that this is a big obstacle, but it does mean a renegotiation. Uh, with the teams that broadcast the, the Alliance League games. Yeah, but everybody everybody <laughs> but can do we that. Can that. We, we but, can get around that. But I don't think for one second we're going to, have to give, uh, you know, you're going to have, uh, this is going to be the panacea. Uh, not at all. So I, I think we, we can see those games now on GA Go if you want to watch them, and that will, I mean, that, that will continue. The games aren't uh, as good, though. Post COVID, yeah. They, like you can get Mayo versus Leitrim on GA Go now. Whereas you'd get Leitrim against somebody yeah. of, a, of a of a similar standard. Like that that's the point. The, the, the television product it will be better, and as a result of that, the amount of television coverage will be better. You need to have a product to televise that's good. Yeah, but look, I mean, you're talking about similar standards, and this is part of the issue too. That you know, you don't just because um, you know you have teams playing in, in you know in the leagues, you get to, okay, games are mostly closer in the leagues, you know, than some of the provincial championship games. But you, you do see someone, for example, Westmeath and Leash met in the Leinster Championship last year. They were both in Division Two, and they're both in Division Three this year. I think Westmead won like 16 or 17 points or something, you know. So you do get one-sided games, and you will continue to get one-sided games no matter what system you use. You know, that, you don't think for one second that because we're going into 4-8s or whatever we're doing, or we're going into, uh, you know, the, the league based championship, that there won't be games that are uh, end up with teams getting beaten. That's the way it is. You know, you've got the 25th ranked team in the country are suddenly going to be playing the last 10 of the All-Ireland Championship. Depends who the draw, but, you know... It could be, uh, you know, it could be a difficult day. But... Yeah, and I guess talking to managers from Division Three and Division Four teams, what they want is to keep their squads together in summertime, when you know the evenings are long and there's an opportunity for them to to play deep into the summer. The same amount of time and training sessions that the Dubs get and Kerry get, and I, I you know, I, I can I can see how that would allow the team to progress and how it would give them the sense that. They are progressing, Brian. It, it, I, I can see totally that your your convictions are are very um, firmly held, and that I've no doubt there are loads of county board chairmen who are listening to what you're saying about the money and thinking, well, how am I going to fund the extra training sessions? How am I going to fund the county deep into the summertime? So that it seems like the central concern is the finances of this whole thing. And no, no that's one. No, no, the finances. Look, I mean, my convictions. Yes, they're firmly held. They're also evidence based. Um, and you know, the three things that we we will come out of this: you dilute the, you, you basically the provincial challenges without a link to the All Ireland series. You've effectively made, made them a pre-season competition. You are diluting the Alliance leagues. There's no question about it. Which is a very successful competition by playing the two uh, as one. You know, the, the league championship as one. And well. I'm convinced that there will be less revenue if option B is um, is, is, is carried. Uh, I haven't seen any evidence to suggest otherwise. Maybe it does exist, but if it did exist, do you think it would be out before now, wouldn't you? Well, it's hard to know because it, it's hard to know who's actually sponsoring any of these and who, who wants uh, an element of change to come through. As it stands, what happens if, if A fails and B fails? We'll go back to essentially, potentially year three of the Super 8 experiment. Uh, so I, this is a question, right? I, what will happen if, if option A and B fail? Because I, I, it's not clear to me. Some, some people are saying we'll go back to year three of the uh, Super 8 experiment. And, and then somebody else has made the point that actually there won't be room in the calendar anymore because of the split season for that to happen. So what's your instinct about what happens at the end of a Congress yeah, with uh, A and B? My own question is, is that it will go... Uh, Ideally, it would have went to year three of the Super 8s. The difficulty is we now have a split season. Uh, so when the Super 8s were brought in, you had an All-Ireland final in September. Now you have an All-Ireland final in July. So I don't think there's going to be room in the calendar, particularly because I remember in 2022, we still have a carryover at a club level from 2021 uh, in terms of club championships. So basically, um, what, what, what will happen is you will go back to a backdoor system uh, and a Talchin Cup. Uh, but there will not be uh, space in the calendar for three rounds of quarterfinals, i.e. Super 8s, so it'll be straight quarterfinal. But what I would also like to see happen was be if both motions fail, that someone like CCC or someone, you know, some committee, look at the merits and, and the arguments that were put forward for both debates and try to get something that maybe can get common ground uh, to move forward. Because I think, as I said at the very outset, 
I don't think anyone would have seen the current system is perfect. In fact, it's far from it. And is there any merit there in, ex- in experimenting system. for a three-year Maybe period? Three years. Yeah. That could come in. That could come in. At, that could be taken at Congress uh, next year. You know, uh, with a view to possibly coming in in twenty twenty three. Right. I'm sorry, one last question on this. Is, is there any merit in, in experimenting with Proposal B for a couple of seasons to see how it works? Um, no. Why not? <laughs> because I've just explained... But, but what, if you're, what, what if you're wrong about the... Um, what if you're wrong about the finances and actually it, it increases the financial income? Sorry, fi- finances are not the key thing. The other two things are much more important in my mind. The devaluation and total desolation of the provincial championships and the dilution of the Alliance Leagues. Because you could really argue that it's making the leagues much more important. Like that, that so I, I can, you know, I can definitely debate you on that one. It's the first one. Well, it's kind well, of you're, a, doing league, you're doing away with league finals for a start. I mean, you could bring them back. You could bring them back. You could. You could easily, you could, you could bring them back. You know, you could, you could definitely, look, you could experiment honest, with that. Honest. Well, you could. Yeah, you, well, you be, could be absolutely honest. bring them back yeah. and, and have a reward for the team that wins its no. extra money for holiday fund or something like. Okay, Dub- Dublin and Kerry finished top first and second in Division One. Well, you wouldn't have okay. it. For, you wouldn't have it for Division One. It's like there was no league final no, this no, year. No, no, no. I'll give you a scenario: Dublin and Kerry, or any two counties, whatever. Dublin and Kerry finished top of Division One. At that stage, they're already in an All Ireland quarter final. They know damn rightly they're going to be beaten three, four weeks. Time. So you don't play but in Division League One, League but League Division League Three League and League Four. League. I mean, there was no there was no league final this year, and the world continued on its merry little access. Yeah, there, there was no league final this year because they knew they were going to be meeting. As it turned out, they didn't meet. <laughs> to their own and other ideas, uh, and we know for that matter. Um, but uh, you know, so uh, no, the league final would be a shadow game. It would mean nothing. It would, it, it, you know. It, so, okay, uh, so the, the league final is more important than. Um, no, no, no. I'm just saying it devalues the league. Um, and that's just one aspect of it. Okay. Be no but the fundamental thing is the, is the um, separating the Ulster, uh, the, the provincial that, that championships the from the All Ireland uh, when it comes yeah. down to it. Okay. And like sure. ultimately, that's going to be an emotional decision for people to make at Congress whether or not they believe the the importance of the uh, provincial championships and the dilution of that. Because you know, as somebody who lives in Leinster, like ultimately watching Dublin win. 15 out of 16, 25 out of 26, which is what's going to happen over the next while. It it kind of feels like progress in the rest of, certainly where our part of the country and potentially in Munster as well, is, is therefore always going to be hamstrung by the reliance of the provincial championships giving us All-Ireland something or other, quarterfinals, semifinals, last 16, whatever whatever um, yeah, yeah, but proposals you put forward. It, 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 but yeah, but you're penalising Dublin, you're penalising Kerry, whatever. It's up to the other counties to try to get up to a standard. You know, I, I've been, you know, I've been seeing some great Leinster finals over the years. I've been in some of them. Uh, you know, so we can get back. I, I think you're just looking at something at a, at, a, at a place in time. And obviously, you know, we've had 130 years of provincial championships and they haven't always been perfect. Far from it. But they're not, a, you know, they, they, they are not an incentive and they do bring a lot of character and, and a lot of colour and a lot of great days. Um, to it and you know okay maybe I'm passionate because I'm from Ulster because we tend to be more but you know anything you, you cannot take that away it doesn't be a bit like taking the Monster Hurling Championship away from Monster. Uh, you, you know uh, it just, you just lose so much you just lose 130 years of history for something that is inferior and make no doubt about it it is inferior this proposal I, I totally agree with, with, with your last point there uh, Brian about the, 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 the value of these the, the, the provincial <laughs> but uh, just, just to a point just to a point about the, the value of these provincial championships and it, this is important I mean like the provincial championships are going to be kept the Ulster Championship as I say is going to be the thing that everybody watches in the springtime because let's face it nobody's going to watch the other three provinces it is like the Munster Hurling Championship the best provincial championship in its own sport people will have their eyeballs on it it will still exist and do you not think that there will still be a value in winning this championship like if if whoever wins the Ulster Championship is probably going to be like I'd I, like, I, I, I just like to see this this happen for the three years as Gerard put to you would you not like to just see this Ulster Championship exist as the, the, the curtain raiser to the All-Ireland Football Championship, the thing that kicks off our season, just for three years to see how it goes. And then in three years' time, value whether or not it's lost its value and, and, and assess it on, on that front. Well, for, first of all, I don't need three years. I know what the answer is now. Secondly, um, it isn't going to be played in the spring. 
it's going to start in January, February, uh, and it is you know so that 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 argument doesn't doesn't wash at all. No, sorry. And, and and do you not think that so is the main thing when you win an Ulster Championship? The, the qualification to the All Ireland Championship is that is that the main Absolutely. thing that Tyrone took away from winning their Ulster Championship this year? Absolutely, absolutely. Right. So the Ulster Championship is already devalued. Then, if you don't really care about winning the trophy and all you care about is qualifying for the All Ireland Championship, no, it's not because that, that is a passport to the All Ireland series, and it gets you. You know, it, you know okay, this year obviously um, you you had to win it to get to the All Ireland series, but there is a reward. You know, where, where, where you know you would have been straight into the Super Eights or an All Ireland quarterfinal before that, so there is a reward. There is a reward, yeah. It's, and, the, and, the, and the best way to go through is to get through the front door. So, well, yeah, no, so it's very important and very valuable. Tyrone and, obviously know, won a couple you, of back doors. You, you, you talk to the people of Cavan who won an Ulster title last year. Yeah. What, what does it mean to them? Absolutely loads. Yeah. And you'd like to think that it would mean absolutely. loads in this, in this, in this new gonna, format it, as well. It's, it's, absolutely. It's going to mean more to them than a Touching Cup medal, I can well, tell you that. But the, the thing All about that... The Cup has its, has its place. So, sorry, Brian. Like The thing about that is that winning that trophy meant everything to Cavan getting the opportunity to play Dublin is not what will stay long in the memory but that's what you're suggesting you're suggesting that the passport to play Dublin is what matters more to Cavan people than winning an Ulster Championship it basically meant that they got to represent their province okay you win the Ulster Championship under the on the proposed B you go nowhere you stay where you are except your Ulster Championship. you win the trophy and you get the medal I suppose look I, I think we, we've we've reached the, the point where I think there's full understanding at least of, of what the, the issues are and in fairness Brian not everybody's coming out to tell us what they think mm. so fair play to you for yeah. for doing that and I, I think you're right it would be great to see the finances and the projections of what proposal A proposal B status quo would actually mean for the provinces for the counties because you know I, I agree with you it is one of the most seismic changes that might ever happen and even if it only comes in for three years or if nothing comes in. See, if nothing comes in, I think everybody's going to be a bit depressed because we're staring down the barrel of, you know, Leitrim up against Mayo. We're staring down the barrel of Longford against Dublin. We're staring down the barrel of, of uh, Waterford against Kerry or even Clare against uh, Kerry in the, in the football championship. And for three quarters of the country, it's like, ah, oh, the grim provincial championships. We have to kind of grind our way through to get to a point where there's an All-Ireland quarterfinal, where there's some good football matches played by teams other than Ulster teams against each other who are of a similar standard. So you can see why we're grimmed out by the prospect of the status quo, I hope. Oh, I'm glad the debate's taken place. I think it's a healthy debate, yeah. And I'm glad to put the, the alternative argument. Yeah, well, thank you for that. No, good stuff. Thanks a million, Brian. Cheers. All right, Nance. Thank you. That's Brian McAvoy, the uh, Provincial Director and CEO of Ulster GAA. OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. Busy show. We'll uh, reflect some of your opinions next on that and we'll also bring you to the papers. OTB AM This is OTB Sports Radio The Football Pod with Paddy and Andy Our new weekly Gaelic football show with Paddy Andrews and Andy Moran I was good at it, absolutely good at it I'll never forget the, the, the final Glucko kicks the point against Kerry I, I didn't even go, but I watched it at home on my own I actually cried at the end of it yeah. I was good at it because I, I just I've been on that journey and I've been very close with some of the guys in that team and it was an incredible moment. It was, it was one of the most iconic moments for, for Dublin GAA. I had nothing to do with it. I would let myself down and didn't contribute and I just basically mugged myself off really more than anything. Download the OTB Sports app and subscribe to the GAA podcast feed now. OTB AM With Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. It is 8.28. Let's bring you through what's uh, going on the sports pages today. We can start with otbsports.com. Kerry Chairman insists process to appoint O'Connor was credible. Uh, Munster can go a long way if Carberry clicks with coaching, says Gordon Darcy speaking on Monday Night Rugby. Zverev threatens legal action against abuse allegations reporter and Sampdoria paid tribute to 80s icon Liam Brady. They released a video on their Twitter feed yesterday where he came out and was welcomed by the crowd ahead of the game in uh, Genoa this weekend. And then there was uh, record rainfall in Genoa immediately afterwards. It was like the gods were crying, having witnessed the greatness that was... Obviously, it's not. It's global warming, by the way. We're all a little bit screwed. The planet is burning. And uh, that was just a little moment before the end. Uh, right. Let's start with the examiner this morning. Bumpy confirmation. That's Jacko uh, in his Kerry gear. So that's obviously a couple of years ago. Jacko Connor ratified his Kerry boss as board chair blasts critics with an axe to grind. That you, Owen Sheehan, they're talking about you. Um, the back page of the uh, the Sun. Fergie's OG. 
He's caught having pop at Ole for resisting Ron. Sorry, for resting Ron. And then no shortcuts. Make sure to tell these lads that's Gavin Bazzini who's saying uh, there's no shortcuts to get into play for Ireland. Hornets, Claude Nine. Watford confirmed the arrival of Claudio Ranieri in a two-year deal. Nice, two years. Work five months, get paid two years. And Jack's keys to Kingdom is the one back there. Fergie, Oli made wrong call. Oli, Ole, Ole. I've never got the correct... So when, when they call him Oli... Mm-hmm. That's like Bexy, Giggsy, Buddy, Keeney, Nevely. That's the Man United nicknames for each other. You sure about that? I don't know. I don't know either. Is it the correct Norwegian pronunciation of O-L-E? I don't know. Oli, Ole. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Like, is it, like, Ole. Have we been mispronouncing it as a Spanish? I mean, that's what I'm thinking. It doesn't sound very Scandinavian whatsoever. Please. Please, our Norwegian viewers this morning, tell us the correct phonetic pronunciation of... Oh, Ellie, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Uh, Cara, get Mo's deal sorted out. This has become the most important talking point is that he's not got a deal and then you're looking, oh, geez, he must be out of the contract. He must be like Pogba, free to talk to people in eight weeks. But no, his new contract runs, his current contract runs all the way till the season after next. So uh, Shane to join squad. Shane Duffy is expected to join up with the Ireland squad after missing yesterday's first training session ahead of the game. He was uh, given leave to attend his grandmother's funeral. And Dilly Ding, Claudio, boss of Hornets. He's back. Maybe he'll win the league with them. Uh, Ole got it all wrong Fergie sticks the boot in on United boss Solskjaer uh, Fergie did he he was just having the chats he was just having the chats and it got picked up and it shouldn't have done Bazuna will wait for keys to City and Tim hits out at false news false news not fake false the Times Ferguson Ole got it wrong spitting fan facing life ban and England issue Ashes warning there's a picture of Emma Raducanu there as well the Ashes tour hangs in balance RFU new chief on Swing Low Sweet Chariot I love to hear that song uh, progression from the RFU always uh, bastions of yeah, whatever the right man Bazunu backs long term plan for boss Kenny it's official Jack's back at the helm in Kerry yet yeah, to come from Poole is the headline on the hurdles Kerry reject disgraceful attacks over O'Connor job did you feel did you feel um, personally slighted did you feel like there was like a I've been bodied I, I, I've, I've made the news the, the Kerry County Board Convention for the selection of the new manager was that like no he's talking about somebody else 16 year old you going yes He's thought, I'm sure he's. Um, I, I wasn't there. I wasn't in the room. I'm sure there was there was terrible things said in the room, and and uh, what happens in that room stays in the room. Uh, it, well, it was all broadcast. It was all broadcast. Yeah, yeah. I have to admit that I did cry at Mitch Roach of retirement. This is the news at Nicholas Roach. Um, so the two main Irish mainstays of the peloton have announced their uh, the cousins have announced their retirement in the last couple of weeks as well. So uh, Nico Roach and Dan Martin both finishing up at the end of this season. Bazuno comfortable. Racking up game time in League One for now, and Liverpool must decide whether or not to pay Salah what he's worth. Uh, Kerry Board defends process as O'Connor appointment is ratified, and the ATP launches investigation into domestic abuse allegations into Zverev is the back page headline on The Guardian. And they're also saying the Ashes tour hangs on a knife edge. So um, my takeaway from our interview with uh, Brian McAvoy is that that's not going to get passed. If, yeah. if there's I that agree. much, if there's that much. Um, Strongly held conviction and also concern about the finances. Like, it's a fair point if, if, um, I don't know, it just feels like we're locked in this constant, <coughs> pardon me, we're locked in this constant debate about the strict, the, the, the structures and the fixtures not being fit for purpose. That, like, doing nothing, which is more than likely going to be the outcome of this, there'll be another committee charged with coming up with a plan. It's disappointing. Because it means we're stuck with the same provincial structures in the summer that we've always had. And we've blown the opportunity that we had during COVID to use the crisis yeah. to experiment with something new. When, when what we've seen is that we want the best teams playing against each other more often. And we want teams of similar standard playing against each other so that they can progress. And there's clear signs of progress. But it's easy, it's easy to, to see why if you have a system that worked well for you, you will protect that. And, and like, that, yep. that, that is the rights of Ulster GAA to protect their own merits. Yeah. Um, like, I, I'm with you. If this thing ain't passing <laughs> uh, after, after that conversation, like, to get 60% on that uh, after that conversation with somebody who's got reasonable concerns as well, uh, this thing has no hope in hell of, of getting through. So something needs to change between now and the vote if uh, this thing is going to pass. Now, one of those things, and I, I accept it's not the entire crux of his argument, as he said himself, but one of the things is the finance. 
what we have is we have a director general of the GEA who is the former director of finance for the GEA. I would ask, is it a conflict of interest? And this is not a rhetorical question. This is a genuine question. Is it a conflict of interest for Tom Ryan to... Maybe he's got too much on his plate. But maybe he... Maybe he's got friends who, who also have uh, a pretty good grasp on finances and a pretty good grasp on the GEA. Is it a conflict of interest to be able to do a financial assessment of these proposals? No, it's do not. Do a financial it's assessment of the current it's situation, it's proposal A and proposal B, just so we can answer that question, because Brian's right. Like, I mean, I didn't know, when, when I'm challenging him on his point, the best I can say is I don't know about what the future will bring. I suspect I'm with you. I suspect that it will lead to a hell of a lot more money for everybody. And I think when we spoke to Connor last week on the show, I think that that was what he was saying, and, he, and he's got... Uh, as good a grasp as anybody has on this. I, I, I firmly believe that it will lead to uh, bigger coffers for everybody. And I would just like to see the Director General of the organisation who has a strong background in finance maybe sponsor a, a financial assessment of those three things, like of these three proposals, these three opportunities. And maybe it's too late in the day for this, but that is one of the reasons why not having a big political voice within the GEA sponsoring one of these things is, is going to be the thing that costs any sort of movement and why we're going to be sitting in the same place in 12 months time it, it wouldn't be a conflict of interest at all because like the facts would be the facts you would you would go through and say well this is what our uh, revenue is going to be this is what our projected attendance f- uh, figure for these is going to be this would be the money given back to the the counties now perhaps there's an issue about how the money gets distributed back to the counties maybe uh, you need to let it funnel through the provincial boards anyway which is probably the whole point of having those provincial boards and Maybe maybe the turkeys voting for Christmas line was was um, was interesting because there's probably a fear amongst the provincial councils that if they're no longer providing all Ireland quarter finalists and semi finalists through their provincial championships, that somehow their power base will be diminished at the top table. And it's been clear from our investigations here that uh, and our, our conversations rather that there there is a huge power base vested in the uh, provincial councils, and and that was why it was good to get somebody from the provincial councils on to explain what their viewpoint is because I've no doubt that there are other provincial councils who feel the same and there are other provincial councils who feel differently about this um, but that's the that's kind of the sense that they have of this uh, and it would it, it would just be business that, that's how you would um, make a cost benefit analysis here's our projection for the next five years on the basis of proposal A proposal B and status quo here are the figures There's, there would there would be no there would be no uh, sponsoring of those figures. That this would just be these are as rigorous estimates as we can give you at the moment. And I think largely it's going to end up being fairly similar. Like the amount of income and the amount of available um, uh, income, Mike, I would suggest will go up with more meaningful games in summertime because more people will go to the games and actually it will be a bit of a boon for provincial grounds, which are let's face it always empty in the summer until the club championship starts anyway. So like, you know. All of a sudden, people I think will go to uh, Mayo on their holidays and take in a game at the weekend. People might go to uh, Donegal for a week on their holidays and take in a game. And I don't know. Here's the thing on that: like you look at uh, the venue decisions when it comes to Division One, and I know that this is much more about Division One. And I apologise to people from other counties, but it's 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 the National League games that I've gone to predominantly have been Division One, and you look at the venues that are used in those league games. Donegal sometimes use Letterkenny. They don't always use Bally Buffet. Kerry half the time use Tralee. Mayo have a half full McHale Park, granted they don't use anywhere else. But all of a sudden Kerry are using Killarney all the time. Donegal are using Bally Buffet all the time. McHale Park is full all the time. Croke Park is full. All the, like, I, w- I would contend that in that Dublin versus Armagh scenario that we brought up earlier on, Croke Park is a hell of a lot more full for a Championship League match than an Allianz League match, as it were. And that just turns the tables on this financial question on its head entirely, I feel. I, I, I really do believe that it is not going to be Allianz League attendances just in better weather. I think the better weather will lead to Allianz League attendances exploding and not just the weather, because that's just maybe a, a very light point, but the importance of it. It is not the league. It is the league becoming the championship. It is, it is the league informing the destination of Sam Maguire. People are smart enough to realise the importance of a game. And we saw just a smidgen of that in the Super 8s. I'm telling you there were positives of the Super 8s that we can take away. I'm not saying it should ever be seen again or, or it should ever be taken out again. But there, it told us, it informed us a little bit about the behaviours of the GEA audience. And we saw a couple of moments that when something was on the line, people came out in force to watch the games, even if it wasn't knockout. Something being on the line doesn't always equal 
knockout. I mean, something on the line can mean a, a league format where you're you're either avoiding relegation or trying oh, to yeah. get up to the next stage. Yeah, Will O'Callaghan is with us. Will, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, lads. How are you getting on? What's the from your Offaly base? What is the uh, mood in Offaly? It, it seems um, Mahon is in the paper saying he he's back in the proposal B. Yeah, and I think um, John Mons had a long record of being in favour of the idea of the Talton Cup coming in, particularly even going back to a couple of years ago, where there was plenty of debate around a second tier competition coming in and whether maybe the teams who end up in there uh, could fade into insignificance during the summer when all the focus is on the main All-Ireland Championship with the teams competing for the Sam Maguire. But John Mon has been... Yeah, pretty clear that he felt that it would be better for Offaly if there was a second tier competition available. What happens to Offaly next year will be determined largely on what happens in Division 2 of the National Football League. They'll be one of the firm favourites to be relegated from the second flight. If they could stay in Division 2 then they'd be playing in the All-Ireland Senior as things stand. But I think even if the reform comes around, I think John's been very clear that he would back the idea of the league being fairer um, particularly under Proposal B like any of the Offaly players that I've spoken to they feel quite strongly uh, roughly along the same lines as the G PA survey, which we heard about last Friday, whereby the overwhelming majority are behind the idea in, I think, what we would call the so-called weaker counties, uh, the idea that at least if you're playing in Division 3 or 4, that you can make your way into the All-Ireland Championship proper on merit if you were to do well in Division 3 or Division 4, but you're also getting meaningful fixtures against teams who are around you in the league. And also, I think if you drop into a second-grade competition and you've already been competitive in the bottom two flights, that that competition will give them something to play for that will be worthwhile for the rest of the year as opposed to maybe playing one or two qualifiers in their season coming to a close. So even while there might be counties that are upwardly mobile, you had Podge Collins speaking on the show last week. I'll declare an interesting example where they're just between the very top tier and then slightly above maybe the teams who are operating in the bottom two flights. But with the amount of positions that will be available under Proposal B in Division 2, there's no reason to think that Clare couldn't have, say, a good campaign within the group stages and then potentially go into a favourable draw to try and get into a place in the quarterfinals of the championship. I think there's a nice balance in Proposal B is the feeling from any player that I've spoken to so far. They're a little bit colder on the idea of Proposal A, admittedly. Yeah, I, I think the difficulty with Proposal A is essentially it's pig Mickey. Like, you're going to end up with uh, one of the worst teams in the country being booted out of their own province to be cannon fodder for one of the better teams in another province. And it just makes no sense whatsoever. Like, it, it, it convince fans of Mayo to go and watch them play a preliminary game or convince fans of Sligo to go and watch them play a preliminary game against... Uh, I don't know, but it, Waterford. It wouldn't be Waterford. So it'd have to be uh, that bottom tier. You're talking Longford. You're talking uh, Wexford, Wicklow. Wexford could potentially end up in Connacht. And what if they win it? Yeah, like it, it, do you know what it, if it, 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 these ludicrous scenarios of of um, a team finishing bottom of Division Three, winning the Talton Cup, and getting promoted? It's like it's as likely as uh, Wicklow winning the Connacht title. Things have gone mm. pretty pear shaped, if uh, if that it, happens. But anyway, I can't see an appetite for it, Jared, because it's very different to say when even Galway's integration was a little bit uneasy into the Leinster Senior Hurling Championship but at least that was a commitment for a long period of time to play within the championship with an acknowledgement that there was no point in Galway walking straight into an All-Ireland semi-final each year with the way that the championship was being changed and similarly for the likes of Kerry and Antrim who've played in the Leinster Hurling Championship in recent times, you know, there's a very firm idea that they were creating two provincials because Munster was worth keeping I'm not sure there's the same argument for keeping the provincial football championships uh, from next season onward if you were to keep Proposal A. Proposal A feels like let's just about keep the provincial championships, acknowledge that there are weaknesses with it and let's try and get a round number so that a knockout championship makes sense. And then I think the whole point of having the provincials and if you were to keep them earlier in the year is the history and the prestige of winning your own provincial championship. I'm not sure if a team was to cross the border to go into an artificial championship, there would be any great excitement about lifting the Nestor Cup, as unlikely as it is that one of the Division 3 or 4 Leinster teams would do so. I'm not sure how people are going to feel about this Eastern Conference, whatever name they would put on it under Proposal A, which would put a batch of teams together too. I'm just, I'm just not sure. I think you either keep the Provincials or you embrace something new. I always felt when the pandemic came around, they missed a chance not to do a group-based championship that year uh, when they tried to keep the provincials alive for the end of that season. And it feels at least, and maybe not within the provincial councils themselves, like the conversation you had with Brian McAvoy a few minutes ago, but in the public and among the players, there's a feeling that at least for a three-year cycle, 
let's give it a shot of going down this so-called Champions League format or a round robin into a championship at the don't, end of it. Don't say Champions League, Will. That'll uh, that'll turn more people off. Just one one very. I know, uh, everyone hates <laughs> the name, don't they? One very very quick point. Uh, I, I get like I. It was made um, by Brian McAvoy a comparison earlier between the, the Ulster hurling championship. Like we, we need to accept that these are very very different sports coming from very very different places. That there are genuinely thirty counties in Ireland who have a chance of making themselves better through football. That is not the same case in hurling and comparing the two things is just... I think hurling in the 80s, uh, late 80s, early 90s was completely different from hurling now, for example. Like the the uh, amount of work being done and that has to be done uh, in counties which are not traditional hurling counties to get them to be competitive. It's, it's a coincidence that those teams uh, came through strongly on the back of a few good, strong club sides in Down and in Derry in particular. Uh, and Antrim Hurling went through a bit of a, a dark spell after that. Like, that's why those teams... I don't I don't think it's possible to argue that they actually improved because none of them established themselves as Division One league teams over that period of time. Antrim were up and down, in and out. They beat Kilkenny twice, I think, in a 15, 20-year period in league games in the depths of winter in North County Antrim where, you know... Uh, all the conditions were ripe for an upset, but that was it. Like they they were the high water marks of of um, hurling and Antrim to suggest that those three counties drove each other on. You know, if they were in all Ireland semi finals, if they were in all Ireland finals, I would buy that argument. But um, I, I definitely think it's apples and oranges comparing the Ulster hurling championship and the Ulster football championship, and uh, and it being devalued um, as a as a thing because there was no there's never been a tradition of an Ulster hurling championship. They were basing that. They were trying to magic that into existence without any kind of long-term future or any campaign for it. So this is the opposite, I think. Um, actually, it, it embeds high-quality action for our best young footballers into the summertime from the weaker counties for the first time ever. Meaningful inter-county games in uh, June for Carlo and for Offaly and for, I mean, oh, okay, we shouldn't really have included Offaly there, but you know what I mean. Over the last decade, you would definitely have had them as a Division 3, Division 4 team. So anyway, look, that's that's our bit on that this morning. Uh, 53106, not 53106, 0879180180 if you want to text us on that one. OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette, put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. What else is happening, Will? Yeah, well, the Kerry County Board Chairman Tim Murphy defending the process that saw Jack O'Connor ratified as senior football manager last week. I remember the outgoing manager, Peter Keane, releasing that independent statement on Friday where he claimed that the majority of players wanted him to stay on. Reports subsequently claimed that the decision to appoint O'Connor was made before the recruitment process was formally initiated, something you were discussing yesterday morning on the show. Uh, Murphy insisted last night, though, the process is credible and he denied any lack of transparency. Peter Creed, meanwhile, has been ratified as the new manager of the Tipperary Senior Ladies Football Team. The former Tipperary and Leash senior men's boss succeeds Declan Carr, who stepped down last month after they kept uh, senior football for next year. Creedon says he's looking forward to what he considers a very exciting project. May are on the lookout for a new chairman as well, because Lee Moffat has confirmed he'll be stepping down at their convention in December. He has opted against seeking a third year at the helm due to what he says are personal and business reasons. Republic of Ireland goalkeeper Gavin Bazunu was in front of the media yesterday. He says the team are still trying to find the right balance in how they play. The squad have begun preparations for Saturday's trip to Azerbaijan in the World Cup qualifiers. Just one win in 16 games so far under Stephen Kenny. There have been plenty of questions about the keeper playing out from the back, but Bazuna feels there's been progress in recent games. Okay. Liverpool legend Phil Thompson, meanwhile, has urged the club to tie Mo Salah down to a new contract. The Egyptian forward has been in superb form, scoring nine goals and providing three assists for his team so far this season. Salah's currently locked in talks with the Reds about a new deal. Thompson told off the ball last night that he feels there's very little value in the market by comparison and they'd be better off giving the money to Mo Salah. Liverpool have also collected substantial evidence in relation to an alleged spitting incident which is believed to have occurred during Sunday's Premier League match against Manchester City. City made a formal complaint about backroom staff members who were reportedly spat at by a home supporter near the dugout area at Anfield. Liverpool say they'll be handing evidence to Merseyside Police if requested, given the potential there for criminal charges. Meanwhile, Darren O'Neill says he's considering a return to the Irish senior boxing team. The Kilkenny fighter was crowned national cruiserweight champion last weekend, securing his eighth national title some nine years after he competed at the London Games. At 36, O'Neill became the oldest ever Irish champion and how he's, he's now mulling over the chance to go to the World Championships. And finally, lads, a seven-race card at Galway today 
the going soft at Ballybrit ahead of the first going to post there of seven at a quarter past one. All right, good stuff, Will. Thanks very much for that. If uh, anybody wants to get in touch this morning about anything that we're covering, as I said, 0879-180-180 is the WhatsApp number. And a reminder, you can subscribe to the OTBAM podcast. Best place to get that these days is on the OTB Sports app, which you can get for free. It's also the best place to listen to uh, our uh, interviews with Brian O'Driscoll. There's a 24-hour window where the only place you can get the full thing is on the OTB Sports app. Uh, now, it is 8.49 this morning and we want to move on. I'm delighted to say Kira McCormack is with us, who's a former Republic of Ireland international who was involved in uh, in helping to bring forward the stories that have ultimately led this weekend to the fixtures uh, in the NWSL, that's the Women's Soccer League in America being suspended following an investigation into allegations of impropriety on the part of a coach. Um, Kira, good morning to you. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Um, so, uh, I, I, you know, I don't want to overplay your role in this, but actually it is quite important in, in terms of creating a culture where people were allowed to come forward, where stories were being believed, where a voice was given to people who had had something happen to them that was completely off the scale in terms of what you would expect uh, a safe environment around practicing sport and playing sport was to be. It, this is the story that broke at the weekend. Obviously, is, is uh, hugely important and hopefully is a tipping point. But from your perspective, it rang a lot of bells from your own story from a decade ago. Yeah, um, that's really nice of you to say. <laughs> um, I, I think, um, you know, even for me, other people that have come, you know, that came before me in other sports, um, I think it just, I mean, I, I think it's good when it does, like these things start to get some light shone on it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, sorry, remind me again. Sorry, what, what did you ask? Well, essentially that um, the, the story at the weekend wasn't a million miles away from your own story and that... Right, 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 sorry. Um, yeah, no, it it um, it definitely uh, for sure was triggering. Um, and again, just because these things have such a pattern, um, you know, just everything from the power that the coaches had um, and how that affected um, the, you know, the, the abuse that happened to, you know, going to management to tell, to tell management what had happened and sort of a quick internal investigation. And then the, you know, coach getting fired and having that kind of put under the rug and then, you know, dealing with it for five years to try to, you know, come forward in our case, it was like 11 years. Um, and then, you know, and, and just, I, I can imagine those players too. You sort of think you're crazy because you're telling people and no one's reacting. And then, you know, then there's like the explosion like there was this past weekend um, with the NWSL. So yeah, there was a lot of similarities for sure with both cases. When you look at the NWSL story, how big a moment is this in terms of getting over the line, in terms of actually being able to speak out and in terms of, I guess, heads rolling to a certain point at executive level in the NWSL. I know your own experience has come from uh, time in, in Canada, obviously. There seems to be a hell of a lot of similarities here where a lot of complaints have been made down through the years, but it's actually not just getting over the bravery of those complaints. It is actually hoping that those complaints lead to something. From the outside looking in, this feels a little bit different and it feels a little bit more significant. Is that what you're thinking as well? Um, you know, it, it's funny. I feel like I'm a little bit jaded sort of from, mm. um, just being in this space for so long. And I think, um, yeah, for sure it's the U S and I think just the magnitude, um, you know, of sort of, it does feel different. I think that's a, a really good way to say it. Um, I think the fact that they have just announced the uh, former U S attorney general, that's going to be investigating. Um, I, I think a huge part of these things is that normally the clubs are allowed to self investigate. And what always happens is essentially it's a PR job, you know, wrapped up in a quote unquote investigation. So from that standpoint, um, you know, if there is actually transparency, which it sounds like there will be hopefully from this, um, attorney general that they've hired U S soccer, hired um i think that that's definitely a hopeful sign and and i think um yeah i mean I, I think as female players like this crap's been going on for so long and and even um you know it's just it's upsetting even when you think about sort of as women you know it, it's just the things we've had to endure just to play the game and and so um yeah you just you really hope that um in this case it does feel like with the amount of the amount of eyes on everything going on i don't think it's going to be able to get swept under the rug but then you still have the situation like we faced in our situation where you know the top of the chain there's no one that's going to knock them out right one of the grim elements of the the paul riley story was 
the element of control he had over the careers of these women that to succeed they needed to be on good terms with this guy and I think it's really important that we realise that this is not an isolated incident that this is a cultural thing it seems not just in the NWSL but any successful women's soccer league that even from your own perspective when you played for Vancouver you make a really good point in that blog post you, you published in 2019 about how if you wanted to play for the Canada national team you had to play for the Vancouver Whitecaps so if you annoyed anybody in the Vancouver Whitecaps you were screwed really in terms of your ambition and it does seem that there is a similarity between that and the current NWSL story where the powers that be weaponize young players' ambitions against them. A hundred percent, you said it really well. Weaponize is kind of the word. When I think about it, you know, I think especially when there's not a lot of material reward for playing, you know, people that are hanging in there that long, like, and I can speak for myself with this, you're, you're doing it because you absolutely love it. And um, like, that's the biggest thing that I felt like in, in the situation with myself personally was, you know, you've given up everything to be, you know, to all the sacrifice. And, and again, not that it's even sacrifice. You love the game and, and you're willing to do whatever and you have these big high dreams and all this kind of stuff. But that's exactly how it felt for, for my case where, um, yeah, I did feel like it hit a point where I either had to decide between like my integrity and speaking up and watching this guy, you know, completely abusing his power. and you know, I was lucky because I had dual citizenship and I knew that I had my Irish passport in my back pocket and I had made contact with Noel King before, who was the manager at the time. And so I knew I had a way out, but, you know, most of those players didn't. And there was plenty of players, again, because the team that was affected, um, I mean, it was the White Caps. He was the coach of, which was that club team, but also he was under 20 World Cup coach. So like players had given up a year of school, um, you know, a good friend of mine, she had been on the 2006 under 20 team as an underage player. So, you know, she was, should have been a star, you know, if it was a normal trajectory and, you know, she ended up quitting soccer over the whole thing. And so, you know, and, and this is the thing now is that it's, you know, 12 years on. And, and I mean, I'm still friends with some of the, the players and, you know, people are in therapy and, and it, it's, it's just, it's, it's really awful. Like, it's not even like it just stops when they leave soccer. It's literally like the last 12 years, people have been picking up the pieces with what happened in our situation. And so, um, yeah, you know, and it's the same thing. Like Sinead Fairley, I played against her. Um, you know, she was a tremendous player and, and it was the same thing where it was just kind of, she just kind of fizzled out. And, um, you know, and, and that's a thing. I just, you know, that that's what's heartbreaking about it is that it like these guys are literally affecting the trajectory of people's careers. And even again, Canada just won the gold in Tokyo, but there's players that, you know, could have been there that that were affected with what happened with Bob Barretta, our coach. And so, um, yeah, it's it is. It's very damaging. And it's not just from a soccer standpoint. It's, it really affects people's lives, you know, and I can speak for myself when I can say that, like, I mean, for my 30s, like it was it was I mean, I was a bit of a train wreck and I never really understood why. And then since I posted the blog, it's like the lights shone and everything's gotten so much better. So, yeah, it's there's major consequences on and off the field to these kinds of situations. Did, did, did that help sp speaking out at the time, like um, writing oh, that, that blog yeah. post? And like, what, what are the, the, the current um, the, the current players who've spoken out in the, the athletic piece going through at the moment? Um, I mean, I know for me, like the word and, and I, you know, it's, it is hard to talk about sometimes because, you know, it's, it's, I mean, all I can really say is that it was such a dark time for me, like after it, it happened and, and, you know, and I think part of it as well, like I wasn't one of the quote unquote, you know, victims in the sense that, you know, he didn't sexually harass me, but like my entire career was upended. Like I had to watch, you know, just essentially like emotion violence um you know i i had to watch knowing that he'd been fired for sexual misconduct and we had to see him go back onto the field um and i don't think i ever really appreciated you know how hard and and again when we were trying to report it and like the gaslighting where you know it's really serious what's happened but then you're telling all we've reported over 30 times to like name every possible avenue that we could have reported to that you're supposed to be you know you're told that you report to and so I didn't expect to be honest like I was kind of just at my wits end and I was kind of at rock bottom in my own life when I came forward and 
um, I didn't really have anything to lose in the situation. And so that's for me where I was like, whatever I'm scared of, of the truth coming out is like, can't be any worse than where I'm at now. And so, yeah, like, like I said, I, I, it was like a tangible lightness, like after the fact. And so I think that's the one big positive with this, where again, these like poor players that what they went through and the way that they covered it up. And I'm sure even what they've been sort of trying to, you know, just trying to sort of um, figure out and, and um, just reconcile from their own playing careers. Like that's the biggest thing that I, I know from my own experience, like the lightness after and and just how it just really kind of made clear for me how much this affected my life in the decade that this was sort of held in the darkness. So in terms of what might actually help into the future and what practical things might help apart from obviously uh, better recruitment and making sure proper vetting is going on so that nobody's ever allowed back into a sport uh, if they've ever had any of these um, uh, instances in the past. Uh, what type of safeguards will help sport get better at this? Because it's not just it's not just girls soccer, it's boys soccer. It's, it's actually all underage sports have had issues with this all around the world. And what we're seeing now is hopefully some kind of reckoning an understanding of it but from your experience what would have helped you guys when you were coming forward early on in that process um i mean i think a big part of it well there's a few things the first i think is education like i you know i've always sort of been more on the outspoken side of things and you know i i got benched like quite a few times because of sort of, you know, respectfully speaking up. And, you know, I came to find out that that's called neglect and it's a form of abuse. And I had no idea. I just thought it was a consequence of my personality. And so, um, you know, my, my friend Eden, that was um, on the uh, 2006 under 20 team and then quit in 2008 when all this stuff was going on, you know, grooming, right? Like she knew what, what she was witnessing was like disgusting, but she didn't have the words or understand what it was, you know? And, and so I think think um I think we have to talk to athletes about like you know just the kind of environment that they should expect and I think parents also need to understand like again no matter what you can accomplish you know in the sport if your mental health is compromised or your physical health or any type of thing that you know compromises your well-being that it's just not worth it you know and then I think um, just on a practical end for, you know, players in any sport once they're in the situation, I think, you know, having a safe place to report because, um, you know, a lot of, I know with Canada soccer, again, I've, you know, we've all kind of gotten a bit more savvy, but like they have a whistleblowers hotline and this is after all this stuff has happened. And it's basically goes straight to the legal counsel, um, you know, for one of the major soccer associations. So that's not an impartial person that's going to try to, you know, help bring truth to a situation. So I think there needs to be like an outside agency agency um that really is at like athlete led and that that you know players can report things that there's you know outside investigations and that there's support too because i think i got really lucky because a, a friend of mine had skied for the national team in canada and there was an awful sexual misconduct case with that so immediately she put me in touch with the whistleblower with this skiing case and so i had support the first month after i had you know quote unquote blown the whistle on the situation and you know and i think that's another huge part of it as well just people you know just having support just so you don't feel like you're crazy or you know it's just overwhelming sometimes to have the spotlight on you so um i think those i mean those four things i think if they were in place i think there'd be i think it would be helpful and then i just honestly think that like there needs to be implementation of laws of some sort where you know it, it's if if you get this information and you cover it up that like there's some kind of consequences for people because i think that there's just way too many people that don't do the right thing and, and you know, enable the abuse to continue. And so, um, yeah, I just think there needs to be some sort of mechanism that if, if they decide to cover it up, that there are consequences for them. And I think that that hopefully would also change people's behavior. And how much of a factor then, and hopefully this is the, the end product of all this, is the idea of even just self-worth uh, as a footballer? Because it's, it was mentioned in the athletic piece that 75% of the players earn under 30 grand a year, and that's in US dollars. And then you've got Alex Morgan who said that there's been this shared idea that because two leagues failed in the past, the NWSL was kind of the last hope for women's soccer. And I think players maybe married themselves to that idea that they couldn't complain because they didn't want to make the league look bad. And, and that idea of actually, no, the problem with the league is not the players whatsoever. The league uh, is good because of the players and the league is bad because of what the coaches have been doing. And it feels that that idea of, 
of self-worth is, is a really, really important step where it will allow people to create this culture where the behaviour that we've now seen evidenced is just not acceptable whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it, there's been a lot of really powerful, I think, documentaries and people speaking up. You know, I, like, I can speak for myself when I can say, like, I grew up in an era that, like, you watch the Olympics and it was these, like, montages of, you know, reaching the top and, and you know, striving for your dreams and all that kind of stuff. And so I think that that also, you have that ideal and then you're in a reality that, like, is so different to that. Um, I think, you know, with Simone Biles getting out of the Olympics with the whole Larry Nassar thing with USA Gymnastics and and sort of just seeing the damage that that was done with that and Athlete A is a really good documentary that kind of like I think sort of shines a clearer light in terms of the realities that go on behind the scenes and then Michael Phelps in the US there was another documentary called Weight of Gold and you know again he is sort of the epitome of what everyone in sports supposedly aspiring towards with like you know all these Olympic medals but then he's on this documentary saying how broken he is so I mean I think I do feel like athletes are getting a little bit more empowered. And I think that there's a little bit more reality behind the mental, you know, health aspect of sport. And I think that, you know, that in and of itself and these really um, powerful athletes speaking up and, and, you know, someone like Simone Biles not competing in the Olympics because it affected her mental health and she just didn't see the value in terms of doing it. Um, I think those things hopefully change a narrative moving forward and that people realize that, yeah, you know, it is worth your mental health is what matters the most and that we do need to start speaking up. And I think, um, I think especially too, like what's been really cool to see with the NWSL is just like all the players supporting each other. And I think in the past, I know from my own experience, it's almost like survival mentality when you're dealing with these toxic coaches and so you know you have players that turn a blind eye or don't say anything or play into the coach's behavior or whatever and so um yeah i i just i think and i hope with all this publicity that just that whole narrative starts to change in, in a weird way here the ending of uh, the games last week and and the suspension of them actually catapulted the story into a, a, a crossover element where people were like hang on a second what's going on over there so it was a very good thing i think in retrospect that that happened because i know people in advance of it were like actually you know what they should play the games you should keep going but sometimes the right thing to do is to call a halt and say this is too big yeah, and I mean, I'm even experiencing that a little bit on a personal level too, you know, like it's it's kind of, you know, I guess I've been sort of thrown into the role of like a spokesperson with all this sort of stuff and I feel like a responsibility to, you know, speak up, but I, I think it's also, it is, it's mentally taxing, you know, I know I'm just speaking on a personal level, it's such dark, ugly subject matter, you know, and I'm, I'm, you know, a, a very happy, optimistic person. And so when you sit in that space for a long time, it's 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 a lot. And I think, um, yeah, and, and again, on a macro level with what's gone on in the NWSL, I mean, I think, yeah, I think absolutely calling the games off on the weekend was the right move because like how how do you just go out there and play soccer when like this type of stuff has gone on? And, and so, um, yeah, I definitely think it was a really positive move for sure. And again, I think it's just another example of where, I think as athletes, like we're saying enough is enough. And, and even as like people, we're just, again, where we've always been given the sort of mantra of like work hard, plow through things, like keep going. You know, I, I think now, I think everyone's just getting a little bit smarter to be like, you know what, like I'm not a machine and like I'm a real person and this stuff is really heavy and dark. And like, we all have to take care of ourselves first. And um, yeah, and hopefully when people see that again, you know, other people sort of support and um, yeah, just put, again, put athletes mental health first. Well, Kira, we really, really appreciate the effort that it takes to speak about this stuff. And you've been very good with your time this morning. Thanks a million for, uh, again, sharing that story with us. Cheers. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's Kira McCormick there, a former Republic of Ireland football international who obviously has some personal experience of uh, that entire situation as well. OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. I should say that in, in 2019, um, the uh, ex-president of the Canadian Football Association, Victor Montagliani, said that in 2008 he hadn't read the report although he did say that uh, the allegations were treated seriously. The Federation was notified through the General Secretariat. Staff was dispatched to meet with the Ombudsman. There were a couple of days of discussions and interviews, and after that it was deemed this coach was no longer with our programme. He was not an employee of the Federation. We would just pay him a per diem as he was coaching. He parted ways with our programme, and the Whitecaps followed suit in parting ways with him as well. I never saw the report, but the information that was given to the board was sufficient. And then he was further on asked if um, it was right that uh, the coach 
Berardo was allowed to continue coaching girls at a Vancouver club months after being released from his role with the national body and the Whitecaps. And he said, I had no answer to that because I don't know what the process is in terms of hiring or a background check. This is a question better posed to the local football organisation. So uh, that is um, just a bit of background and context on that story. Nine minutes past nine, we're going to take a quick break and then we're back talking about uh, football in inner city Dublin next. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Off the ball. Jamie caught Frank with quite a bad challenge and the physio was patching him up and Les Seeley, his turn turned to Frank, he went, Frank, get back on and do him good and proper. He said he took a liberty there. He said, make sure you leave it on him good and proper. And I'm stood there, I'm thinking, oh, hang on. He's talking about him doing my... This ain't right, you know? Off the ball. Weeknights from 7 and weekends from 1. This is OTB Sports Radio. Live 24-7 on the OTB Sports app. Car insurance is boring, but you don't have to be. Get Set Go is the kind of car insurance you can sort in a few minutes online, then bounce on with your day. Are you ready for quick start insurance? Get a quote now at getsetgo.ie. MCL Insurance Services Ireland Limited Trading is getsetgo.ie is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. OTB AM With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. All right, 10 minutes past nine. If you want to get involved this morning, we'd love to hear from you. 87 180 is the WhatsApp number. Or, of course, you can always uh, leave a comment in the YouTube stream. Um, big response to our interview with Brian McAvoy a little bit earlier on. Um, and Peter was wondering, what do you think Wexford's players' mindsets were going in to play Dublin in a knockout game this year? I think the whole... I think I think a lot of things about this, right? It's It's impossible to form fully formed views on the basis of this year's championship given that it was straight knockout but it's not a million miles away from straight knockout and a qualifier where you still actually have no chance of progress like your dream when you're knocked out of your provincial championship is to win a couple of games maybe get a couple of draws at home and have home advantage against teams who are one division higher than you and maybe you could reach an all-around quarterfinal but when you reach the all-around quarterfinal you're going to get spanked mm. Uh, yeah, uh, like the, it's an interesting question, the one on, on Wexford, because like as it turned out, Wexford had a good day out against Dublin. I mean, we spoke to the manager afterwards and it feels that there was like a, not a satisfaction with it, but like it, it was as fulfilling uh, an outcome as you could have hoped for before that game. We all knew what the, the, who the winner was going to be before that game. Now, the thing is, if you actually have that fixture early in the year where Dublin are on their team holiday and Wexford are uh, showing up to, to Parnell Park or Wexford Park or wherever that game will be played you give Wexford an even better chance and that's a massive game for them and then they get to do it again the, 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 like w- the, the, the following year but the main thing is that the main thrust of their season will not be based on that Dublin result it's not necessarily a shot to nothing but it will allow a couple of upsets here and there while maintaining the idea of progress in the main championship and the problem that is that you see that as a good thing and the Ulster counties who have been involved in a good championship for so long see that as a bit of a disaster that's the that's where these two things can't yeah. they can't mesh either the entire country says sorry Ulster you're just going to have to live with this for a while and see how it benefits you and I actually think that it would really benefit I mean we didn't get into the whole fact that Ulster teams rarely win all Ireland's that like we're, we're in a golden period over the last 30 years where they've won 7 or 8 mm. versus like norm, normal times when they kill each other so much yeah that they end up being not battle hardened but completely exhausted suspensions injuries happen uh, more often and it's going to be much easier for Dublin and Kerry to win all Ireland and Mayo ultimately into the future than it will be for um, Ulster counties if, if the status quo persists so we'll see we'd love your views on that you can get us uh, by leaving a comment on the YouTube stream or of course you can tweet us at off the ball AM now uh, it is uh, Black History Month and um, there's a football history walking tour that is done by Aon Reardon and Gary Cook and I'm delighted to say both Aon and Gary are with us this morning um, Aon I might start with you first it, it is Black History Month tell us a little bit about your uh, football walking history tour and what you're doing this month well, myself and Gary uh, have been doing this for the last year or so. I suppose it was born out of lockdown. A lot of people had very little to do, no matches to go to. And we've always been interested in the in the conflict between soccer and GAA over the last 100 years and how, you know, official Ireland really looked down its nose on soccer. And if you look at Crow Park and we walk from Crow Park to Dalymount Park, it's actually physically in a in a soccer area. It's like an alien spaceship 
uh, in, a, in, a, in a very much a soccer area, in an area, but not of the area. So if you think of all the internationals that come around there, you know, Jack Byrne, Curtis Fleming, Wes Houlihan, and some names that you mightn't be familiar with, like Tom Farkerson, who, who was an IRA man who became a goalkeeper for Cardiff City in the 20s, uh, or, uh, or, or other names like that, Paddy, Paddy Moore, who, uh, who played in the, in the 30s, was an incredible goal scorer and had a, had a fight with alcoholism until his early death. So there's a lot of, you know, conflict between the two games, the time that an Archbishop of Dublin tried to cancel a soccer match in the 50s. Uh, all that history of, of how uh, young people in Dublin and around the country, if they played soccer, they were feel, made feel not particularly Irish uh, if they were if they went to certain schools. So we talk all about that, the time that Liam Brady had difficulty in school, John Giles had difficulty in school. But what's also part of the history of, of the Irish soccer team, it's all, often reflected um, parts of Irish society that we didn't really want to talk about. Uh, the Irish abroad, for example. And in the 80s and 90s when I was growing up, you know, we were a little bit sniffy about players playing for Ireland with English accents. We didn't really understand the nature of Irishness um, in the UK. Uh, and certainly when you're going through the tour, you think of all the names of people who have suffered, who are, who are black and Irish and suffered racism. So Curtis Fleming is from Ballybock and he's spoken about, about racism. There's a player that people might be familiar with, a guy called Ray Kyo, who played for John Condra. He's, a, he's the, regarded as the first black player to play in the, in the League of Ireland. He, grew up in a mother and baby home, and he managed to play on the Dunkondra team that beat Bayern Munich in the European game in 1962. That's the programme there. We take out programmes and jerseys as we go along. And then, of course, Chris Hutton, first black player to play for Ireland. He played in Damon Park in 1979. That, that was his debut. And players like uh, like Paul McGrath as well, who's spoken about his his um, battles with, with racism as, as a young Irishman too. So that's his debut against Italy in 85. So... You know, while we're talking about the history of these two games, which is very much the history of the search for Irishness, um, Black history is a very big part of that. Uh, and for Black History Month, we wanted to place a, a particular emphasis on, uh, uh, on that side of things in the, in the history tour this, this Sunday. And Gary, were you always into the, this part of the Irish football history or is this something that you're kind of uncovering as you go as well? Uh, well, certain aspects of it I was always uh, completely uh, aware of and particularly you know Dunphy talked about it a lot uh, about you know the difficulty of, of playing soccer uh, in the in the 50s in, in Ireland and you know how they were sort of considered a second class citizens and so on so I was aware of it and I was aware of things like the ban on um, you know on, on, on people playing foreign games uh, and so on and what that actually meant for some people who were you know who were thrown out of school before before they did their leaving cert because they're caught playing soccer, you know. So it's certainly something that I've been aware of for a long time. Yeah. Hey, Dunphy's from Drumcounter, I think, as well. So you obviously take him in as as you go, do you? Uh, yes, yes, he is taken in uh, absolutely. Uh, well, he, I mean, he he spoke very eloquently about it. He, he describes it, I think, extremely extremely well. Um, you know how, how how difficult it was. At that time, and and also, you know, both the social and the, the, the political and the social aspects of, uh, of playing football uh, at that time, you know, kind of a lower class game, as he said on uh, RT one night. He goes, "Yeah, we were spat at," you know, and like, I, you know, it, it sounded kind of almost comic, and we use it not very much, quite a lot, but that is kind of the reality of it. I mean, he, he taps into something that's very real. Hey, uh, it, it's um, it's interesting that like. Uh, there's definitely a belief that street football is is dying away. When you're walking from Croke Park to Daly Mount, you're you're walking down a lot of those red brick streets where, like, you know, if there were no cars, the kids would actually be able to play football. Uh, and yet we we are still seeing the area produce Jack Burns, and there are a number of other younger players who are still coming through. So it is still a football hotbed. It, it is, and uh, by the way, if you do do the tour, your Eamon Dunphy impression will improve uh, greatly. I know mine has over the course of the last year. So uh, by the time you're finished, you'll be um, you, you'll be much better. Yeah, we we talk a lot about about, about Eamon, about John, but about players like Patrick O'Connell, who came from just beside Crow Park, who then went on to play for Manchester United uh, and then to manage Barcelona. And people aren't necessarily familiar with, with Patrick O'Connell. Uh, Alex Stevenson, who came from Richmond Road as well, a few doors down from Eamon Dunphy, and his first cap was in 1932, but his last cap, his second cap, I should say, was in 1946, 14 years of a difference. And he taught it because he was Protestant. Um, and that was part of the sort of the sectarian history, if you like, of the, uh, of the 1930s and 40s in Ireland. That wasn't the case, just everything wouldn't, wouldn't release him. But yeah, in around the stadium, 
Uh, and this is what I've always been interested in because I used to teach in Sherrill Street and and Crow Park and Gaelic football and Gaelic games was pretty irrelevant to those children. They were they were soccer kids. Soccer was what they, they were interested in. So the likes of Stephen Elliott, uh, you know, the likes of Wes Hulahan, um, Kenny Cunningham, all these names come from from around uh, around Crow Park, uh, and yet their game, their culture, their heritage was soccer. That was a game that that meant most of them. That's that's how they sort of uh, interacted with the world. And yet official Ireland really looked down on it. And it's it's only since the 1970s and probably into the 80s that the education system has in any, in any way embraced it. And even to the to this day, if you think about education, rugby has been in second level schools for 100 years and more. GA has been in primary schools and secondary schools for 100 years and more. But soccer still has a kind of a difficult relationship with the education system. Uh, and that's a lot to do with social class as well because as, as gary talks about from john giles's book you know if you played soccer you were considered to be a corner boy going up to dailyman park and we can't pretend that that's completely gone from irish society uh, who goes on the tours who goes on tours gary uh, a lot of bored <laughs> bored soccer stars. Uh, there's a what there's, there's a wide variety of people who go on the tours i mean some of them are, are very definite sort of League of Ireland fans and uh, go to a lot of matches. Um, uh, and some of them are just regular kind of, you know, husbands and wives and families. And, uh, you know, did you, you, so there's a, there's a big cross-section of people who, who go on it. And, uh, you know, as I know from Apre Match, you know, Irish people are, are definitely into comedy and they're into sport hugely so you know they get a little bit of they get a little bit of both uh, on on this tour it's mainly a history walking tour you know it's mainly about the history of it but obviously it's got to be vaguely humorous as well um but yeah all sorts of people go it. so we, we, we go from 1916 to, to to we say 1916 to jack's army but there's a lot of people you know, uh, from that revolutionary period, who were, who were soccer people, members of the squad, you know, uh, Oscar Trainer, who was very much a soccer man, but um, felt ostracized a, 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 as a soccer man. Um, so we talk all about that and, and Bloody Sunday, the fact that there was a, a steward in Bloody Sunday who was banned and saw all that carnage, but was banned uh, for playing soccer in 1924 and, you know, a guy called Joe Steins. So all these little histories and, and, and little stories um, of the conflict between the two games, the fact that the first president of Ireland was banned from being a patient of the GEA because he attended the yeah. soccer. You know, there's, there's lots of little th- stories that for a modern generation is probably a little bit strange, um, but was very real in the search for Irishness through sport uh, over the last hundred years. And black history is is very much part of that. Uh, and it's it's really refreshing, I suppose, now, when you think about the Irish team uh, taking the knee in Hungary, how in 1936, the Irish team uh, did the Nazi salute in, in, in Daly Mount Park, not knowing what it meant. But this is all part of the uh, of the history of, of, of how sport and politics intertwines. It's interesting that you use the phrase um, ostracized there, Aon. And, and, and I wonder, Gary, like from your perspective, looking at people like Eamon Dunphy and, and John Giles down through the years, how much, not just their, their footballing ability, but their personality and the people we got to know as pundits was informed by that, informed by an us against the world sort of mentality that came with being a, a young footballer. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's that's undoubtedly true. And, and um, you know, they talk about it. Like the, the, there's a sense, I suppose, from the Dunphy and Giles Thing that you know, there's almost a sense of ownership, uh, and and it goes right, you know, right back to, say, the 1990 World Cup when Dunphy was going off on one because, um, you know, uh, I remember the Ireland Egypt match, and uh, he was giving out yards about how Ireland were playing, uh, and I understand that because he was he, he he felt that he was coming from a place of, I guess, authenticity and a real struggle. With, with playing uh, football, it wasn't a slam slam dunk. It wasn't like it is now where you might play, uh, you know, GAA and, and, and soccer and all sorts of other games as well. It really had a stigma. So they, there's a real, I presume, there was a real sense of coming through something. And also because, you know, they're, you know, base, basically from, you know, rougher neighborhoods. And, you know, soccer was the under, uh, sort of the, the, the underbelly of society. Uh, and kids who didn't have a huge amount of any kind of, they weren't part of official Ireland, as Dunphy talks about. So yeah, absolutely a big struggle. Uh, and with that, a, a, you know, and then, and then making it as well in England, 
which at the best of times, I say, is an incredibly difficult thing to do. I think a lot of people don't understand probably just how difficult it is to actually make it in professional uh, football uh, and and how, how, how difficult it is for lo loads of kids who don't ever make it. So these guys have really come through a journey and you had the sense of that journey. Uh, and of course, it, at times, you know, it's it, it sounded a little bit, um, I suppose, uh, uh, as they were, they were the only ones who ever played football, uh, but that was what made it so interesting. You know, they're, they're great. They're just fantastic. Uh, like really not, sorry, go on. Yeah, but there's a play, like Con Martin's a classic example. Con Martin is somebody who was a Gaelic footballer, played for Dublin in 1941, wins the Leinster Championship with Dublin in 1941. They discover he plays for Drumcondra in soccer and they wouldn't give him his medal until 1971. Goes off, plays for England, or plays for Ireland against England, scores a goal in that famous game at Goodison Park. Irish enough to wear that jersey that day, not Irish enough to get his Leinster Championship medal. And this is the stigma that was attached to, to soccer, less so rugby, because I think rugby was since... You know, it was an elite game played in elite schools. You know, it was 32 county, it was amateur. It didn't have the stigma that soccer had because there was the social class uh, element uh, of it. And uh, um, all those stories of, of what happened to, to Con Martin, the way that John Giles says that when he left Ireland in the, as a 15 year old, he said he didn't feel Irish because he was constantly being reminded in school that he wasn't what he was doing wasn't Irish. Um, and so we, we talked a little bit about the Christian brothers and, and where, where they were coming from and, and why they felt so strongly about it. And, you know, we talked about the Liam Brady story about how there was yeah. a conflict in his school between, between playing a Gaelic football match for his school and representing Ireland in a schoolboy international on the same day. And as Gary says in the tour, you'd expect the school to celebrate this, but the school threatened him with expulsion if he played the soccer match. Which um, he did, of course. <laughs> Which he did, but like, so we need to know where where did this resentment come from? And and part of it is about you know Christian brothers going into the order in their early teens, probably trying to escape poverty from parts of the country that viewed soccer as having a link with the British Army because there's pockets of soccer around the country, garrison game, that kind of thing, and all these prejudices that came in. And these kids just wanted to play, just wanted to play soccer, just wanted to be who they were. But the Irish education system did not reflect who they were. And so there's whole generations of that. And still today, uh, I just find it really interesting, the whole quote, quote park dynamic and uh, uh, and the number of players that have come from around that stadium who play for Dublin, which I think is pretty small in the last hundred years, but the numbers who play for Ireland is, 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 uh, is much higher. In men's and women's football, Libby O'Toole as well is, a, is another player from the area uh, who's who's graced the, the Irish jersey. And then you finish up at Delhi Man Park, which obviously is this kind of uh, literal metaphor for the state of Irish football. Like the beginning, the green shoots of regeneration are right there. The local activity around the club is um, is actually a beacon in Irish football, and yet they still haven't been able to get the funding over the line properly. And, the, you know, maybe maybe we're, we're closer to the regeneration of that now than we ever have been, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's the type of thing that maybe gets kicked down the, the, the road a little bit. Well, well, we talk a little bit about that. Myself and Gary talk about, the, about this, and I, I talk to soccer people about why soccer still isn't politi politically important. Uh, and I see that in Leinster House. Um, just the kind of sway that other codes have and other games have over the political system that soccer never has had. And part of that is because of the mismanagement of the game from within the FAI. Part of it is because of the traditionally the type of people who, who played the game were effectively powerless. And, uh, and emotionally and financially in lots of other ways, Irish football people have turned to England with a real chip on our shoulder, um, you know, uh, complex about ourselves for the last 70, 80 years we follow English teams we don't respect a player unless he's played in England we don't respect a manager unless he's managed in England uh, and and that chip on our shoulder is something we're really going to address because myself and Gary feel that there's huge appetite for a proper domestic Irish football industry but people don't believe it um, so what's happening with Daily Mount and also what's happening at Talker Park um, you know, there's this huge growth in the game. I was at, you know, the Shells game there on Saturday, the first ever televised uh, Women's League of Ireland game. The buzz around Daly Mount Park at, at Bowes games is much better than I was in the 90s. But still we have this sense that you know, we can't be serious about a domestic football industry. And I think we have to challenge that. And we have to challenge politics to care about it. Because going back to the black history stuff, what football is doing in Ireland for integration 
and you can see the you know the ethnic mix, mix of, of players representing Ireland today is really exciting, really exciting, um, uh, of of this new Ireland of, of of what really really it means to be Irish in, in the modern day, um, and I really think the state and politics needs to back soccer more, uh, and needs to pressurise soccer more to to do more uh, to lift people because it, it really ha- is is an incredibly powerful game. And we can see that on the tours, and Gary has said, we got, we got people from all ages and all generations who come who love the game and feel really strongly about it. Uh, and, and they love the nostalgia that we talk about. But it's not just about nostalgia, it's also about the future. So give us the, the sell. If anybody wants to go on the tour, it's this weekend, is it? Yeah, well, we have them every weekend. Um, but we're doing a particular you know, emphasis on black history this, this weekend. But if you could email footballwalkingtour at gmail.com. And, and we'll reserve a place for you. Uh, and it's at 12 o'clock on, uh, on Sunday. We go from the Crow Park area uh, up to Jadim and via Talker Park and, and via Eamon Dunphy's old house. So that's, a, that's an important part of the whole experience. <laughs> How much is it? It's free. It's free. It's a free tour. But we do ask for, we have, a, we have to get a, a, an insurance claim in case somebody, you know, finds uh, Gary that funny that they fall back under a car. So we um, uh, we do have a, we have to get an insurance policy. So we just ask for a contribution to that. That's all. All right. Good stuff. Uh, Aon Reardon, Gary Cook, enjoy the tour this weekend, lads. Thanks a million for joining Thank us. You. Thanks very much. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Uh, so that is this week. Uh, you can get info on the tours at Football Tour Dub on Twitter as well. OTBM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. It's a good point about the uh, role that football's playing in terms of integration and uh, it's the type of thing that um, with a bit of funding and I, I know they have really brilliant people working on that within the FAI but uh, clearly it's not something that is invested in by the government it's not something that we have a ring-fenced fund for um, and maybe we should It's interesting as well that Ireland produced some of its greatest ever players in the height of the ban uh, that even in those circumstances uh, Ireland were, were managing to, to, to produce quality footballers and probably make you question uh, how are we producing that level of footballer uh, in the modern day but um, I guess that's a, a can of worms for another day the, 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 the tour sounds amazing um, a sucker for a walking tour I think it, it absolutely sounds class uh, unfortunately not in Dublin this weekend but I 100% would have gone to that especially with the, the, the people that they have showing up this weekend as well OTBA I'm brought to you by Gillette good morning start with Gillette put your best face forward with their new and improved resident you gone back down to Kerry to try and make some peace is that what's good going point on? actually I probably shouldn't go home <laughs> here's what's coming up on OTB Sports Radio today Ronnie Delaney OTB Gold uh, from 1 o'clock also from the general area I think uh, Dadcast at 3 o'clock career retrospective Stephen Elliott there you go at 4 o'clock Jerry Eisenberg on Ali uh, is OTB Gold tonight at 6 and then live the show with Joe from 7 this evening. We're back tomorrow with Nicola Talent, James Skell, Fergal Logan and much more. That's a doozy of a show coming up for you tomorrow. We're going to leave you with Gordon Darcy and Kean Tracy from the Indo with Joe Malloy from Monday Night Rugby. Enjoy. Clean sweep for the Irish provinces in the United Rugby Championship. We had Connacht beating the Bulls by 34 points to 7. Ulster, a bonus point win of course last week against Glasgow. They beat Zebra away 36 points to 3. Munster against the Stormers, an interesting game at Thomond Park. 34-18 in the end. Doesn't tell the full story of the first half certainly. And then Rodney Prayed, Dragon 6, Leinster 7 was an odd scoreline and an odd game in some ways. Very happy to say Keane Tracy from the Irish Independent is with us. Hey Keane. Hey Joe, how are things? And Gordon Darcy is along as well. Hey Gordon. Joe, how are you getting on? Yeah, very well. Might just touch on Connacht before we get into the Munster game. I know you watched that as well, Gordon. So Connacht, they were 7-0 up, I think, inside two minutes. Jack Cardy and Tom Daly, excellent throughout. I was reading, I didn't see this game, but it seemed like it was really impressive Connacht performance. And Jake White talking about how players at Connacht only take contracts there to try and get noticed by quote-unquote bigger teams and the Leinster players who don't get contracts go down to Connacht. Probably not the greatest thing to say right before you head out to the sports ground. Yeah, I'd say <laughs> it, in hindsight he probably regrets that. I'd say he just didn't, like, I think there's a, there's, a, there's we have to accept that a lot of these South African teams are still getting used to Northern Hemisphere rugby. Um, uh, listen to something with Matt Giddo and he was saying that they just don't watch European rugby. Um, so I doubt they spent a huge amount of time uh, on on Connacht and um, much to their to their to their detriment. Um, 
they started re- like I'd say Jay White's looking at that he's trying to not throw his players under the bus but you know really they were they were outplayed and they were outcoached um, and I'd say that was probably that, that probably wrangling in the in, in the back of his head Interesting in any ways in particular you would have said they were outcoached? Just the like it's 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 the the the, the Bulls and to a certain extent the, the Stormers from the two teams I watched at the weekend they're playing a watered down version of what South Africa do um, that kind of uh, very very physical confrontational um, approach and yeah they got some dominance against Connacht and um, some big put some big penalties in the scrum they got a couple of malls going but ultimately their lack of uh, I suppose the lack of quality at, at delivering basic skills undid them whereas you look at what Connacht were able to do which was um, you know Jack Harty even though it was under pressure in the early 20-30 minutes um, just kept at it and just didn't disappear didn't drift off the gain line kept going kept his team on the front foot and eventually Tom Daly Tom Farrell got to the fore and, and Connacht kept their game plan was just it, it was more it was much more impressive um, the South Africans just relied on Route one, and then when they didn't get the inroads they needed consistently enough, they didn't have they don't have the players to to think their way out of the game, and they're not they're not asked to do that re- regularly. Um, the guy on the wing, um, Jacobs, uh, arguably their most dangerous player. Jeez, every time he got the ball, he just looked electric. He got his first pass, I think, at about 70, 68 or seventy minutes, and that tells you everything you need to know about a team. When a winger gets touches the ball for the first time from one of his own players in you know the last 12 minutes of a game kind of that that's a fairly good illustration of how they were set up King Connacht are in for a tough season with the new format and qualifying for the Champions Cup is going to be difficult and they won't even have the international windows where you know there are more player international players away at other clubs and provinces where they can make hay at times they've done that in the past so they would have been disappointed last week to lose the way they did in Cardiff and that's what makes Friday night such a big win against the Bulls, who would have been smarting from the Leinster game. They have the Dragons in Galway on Saturday coming, Connacht, and then they're away at Thoman in week four, and they have Ulster at home week five, and then it's take a breath with the November International. So you can't overstate what a, what a big victory it was, and then Dragons coming on Saturday, that's a chance for Connacht to get some momentum going in a big way. Yeah, well, yeah absolutely. We, if, if you give... Oh, sorry, Kim, you built all there. Sorry, Gordon. Um, yeah, I think it was the manner of the, the victory, really, that was so pleasing. Um, I know we'll get on to talk about Munster, but you look at, like, Connacht scored five tries and they were all scored by backs, which was seriously impressive. Mm. Um, it was, they went down early on, like you said, Joe, and having, you know, been beaten last weekend, they, their heads could easily have dropped. And the thing about Connacht is, like, there's been so much change there in the summer in terms of the coaching setup. I know Andy Friend is still there and he's doing... A really good job at what he has but you look at like you know their defense coach Pete Wilkins has gone from defense to attack D. Walsh Seneca has come in from Grenoble and then Mossy Lawler and Collie Tucker have been promoted from the academy so there's a lot of new ideas there being put into the melting pot and I think that was going to be one of the biggest challenges uh, for Connacht in the early part of the season is how quickly they can adapt to those new ideas but some of the tries that they scored were seriously good. Like, I mean, Mac Hansen's try, I know it's only week two in the season, but you'll struggle to see a better try all season than that. And that, like, that, that's another kind of, you know, it's an interesting one. You know, Mac Hansen has come in. Not many people would have been aware of him. He played with the Brumbies. And uh, Andy Friend has his real knack of, you know, finding, you know, unearthing these hidden gems, really. Um, he's a guy who's only 23. But to score a try like that in the conditions, I mean, Jake White spent so long. He, he was at it after the game as well, like talking about playing up a hill in the wind and the rain. But Connacht certainly had no problem, you know, and I know they're more used to it, but like running in tries, like like I said, five tries from the backs, I thought, thought spoke volumes for their approach. Mm-hmm. Also complaining about a hill. About a hill. One, is there a big hill in the sports ground, Gordon? And secondly, I mean, you get the hill for the other forty minutes. It's a silly thing to bring up. Yeah, like you're, you're, you're. Uh, it's a, it's a. Excuse the terrible. It's a level playing field because exactly as you're saying, you 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 get it for one half and uh, you don't get it for the other. Um, yeah, like it's. I think you know where Connacht played and Keane's right. They scored four tries through their backs. They really have to be playing that type of a game because they're tight five and their pack is not built to go toe to toe with them and that's going to be their Achilles heel right the way through this season mm. you know you're talking about the 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 list of games they have coming up um, you know this is a very different monster team 
um, coming in, coming to you know that they'll be they'll be facing. You know, more, I think this the other end of the spectrum. Munster scored four tries through their pack. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be a it's a, it's going to be very different and very hard for them because. Um, they just, you know, and while getting Mac Hansen is a great, you know, he's great. They weren't overly short on outside backs. You know, you would have loved to see a six foot eight, six foot ten second row going in there to add a bit of ballast in in, in there. Mm. I know they signed. Um, I'm going to get his name wrong now. Uh, the second row. Um, yeah, thank you. I wasn't even going to try a try a stab at that. Um, and like and he's and he's you know he's kind of papering over the, over the crack. They need a little bit. They need I suppose they need him. They need um, Papa uh, Papa Ely to be to be fit and to be and to be playing regularly to have a chance um, because you know they are they are uh, they are a lightweight squad and they need to and they need to play. And I think uh, Keane's right there. They're playing with a, they're playing a type of game that Andy Friend is playing with their strengths, which is playing at that tempo. But it's high risk stuff. Um, and you know, as soon as Jack Harty isn't isn't there, they start looking a little bit. They start looking a little bit light. To Munster thirty four, Stormers eighteen. Then I suspect a lot of people would have watched this match live on television. Nice kick off time. Uh, Stormers in town. Keen to give like the blunt summary for people who didn't see the game, and then we can pick out all the nuance and get your thoughts on it. Uh, first, I suppose thirty eight minutes really. Stormers play all the rugby, look very good ball in hand at times. Few monster mix up in defence. Suddenly it's fifteen nil to the Stormers. They could have had another try. Peter Amani fingertips avert disaster there. Munster get crucial try just before half time so it's 15-7 and you kind of feel they'll kick on in the second half and they do but it's all very much about and Gordon referenced it power forward oriented play you know you wouldn't say it was all about craft and free flowing rugby and in the end Munster power wins out 34 points to 18. That's like I said a blunt summary of the game. It was, it was a pretty interesting watch. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, the Stormers, like, we, I'm sure we'll get on to it, like, the, the South African teams have flattered to deceive in the, in the first two weeks. But, like, we've just mentioned the Bulls against Connacht. I mean, they're supposed to be the strongest of the South African teams. But, yeah, like, the, the Stormers, they, they really hurt Munster early on. And, you know, like, Munster may be damned if they do, damned if they don't at the moment. Like, they, they did show, like, unbelievable character to turn it around. But I do agree with you, Joe. I think it's all well and good, you know, playing a game like that against an understrength Stormers team. But we've seen Munster come unstuck by playing a similar limited uh, game plan when it matters most against like your Leinsters and your Saracens over the over, over the last few years. And obviously, we're we're picking out some of the strongest teams in Europe. But ultimately, that's where Munster have, have fallen short. But look, there there was still a lot to like from from their performance. I think. Um, you mentioned there Peter O'Mahony's intervention. For me, that was the real turning point on on 24 minutes. Um, it was absolutely crucial because if the Stormers go in there and score a, a third try, like I mean, it's it's a massive uphill battle for them. But they really collapse, and I think so much of that was down to the pressure that Munster exerted. Uh, Jack O'Donoghue's whose try just in half time was crucial, and then the Stormers had a yellow card just after half time, and then Munster followed up with a try. I think through Jean Klein, I think it was. Mm. Um, so you're talking about crucial time of the game there before half time and after half time and, and the yellow card and that was that that was the game really but yeah look there was uh, i suppose a disappointing lack of invention but if munster are running out with a bonus point win i suppose johan van gran will say it was a case of job done but i was down in limerick um the week before last for the sharks game and you know it, it, you could see a lot of what munster were trying to do it wasn't perfect but they were absolutely trying to move the ball wide but there was none of that. There was bits and pieces, to be fair, but it was definitely more they were looking to, to keep it up the jumper. And like I said, you look at Connacht scoring five tries through their backs. Munster's five tries were scored through their forwards, which is probably a perfect summary of, of how they look to play. But look, they're two bonus point wins after two. I don't think we can complain, but I think going forward for the season, it's for Munster, it's all about getting a better balance between having that forward game and getting their backs uh, more involved because they had so much firepower there. Yeah. Gordon, I was watching pre-match the Stormers head coach John Dobson was doing an interview with Murray Kinsella on RTE and I I was was raising an eyebrow because he was talking about how well, look, you know, playing against, you know, this Irish side, they're all going to be about power and set piece and of course, once they get into the 22, we're used to a bit more glitz and glam in a 20 inside 22 they'll just be one off runners and you're kind of thinking who's the South African team and who's the Irish team here and yet it played out 
exactly as he said, really. I mean, I know you said maybe the Stormers' game plan is kind of watered down South African, but to be fair, they played all the rugby in the game. And, and I don't know, did they run out of steam or just they didn't have the power to compete yeah. with Munster? But like first half, I know who the yeah. better passing team were. Yeah, and, like, and, that's, and that is fair, but I think you've like... I can't believe I'm actually about to defend Munster, um, which is... Uh, <laughs> Hold your nose. Hold your <laughs> nose and do it. It is, yeah, it's so, it's so COVID. Um, but I think, um, like, the Stormers' approach was still very, very direct. Like, you know, a couple of crucial line breaks and, um, you know, they were... And they were you know, for any team to be able to unwind from them was, you know, to get back into the defensive fight was 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 going to be was going to be hard. It was still, you know, born off of fairly direct, um, fairly direct play. Um, I think, like, they also got to put that there's an awful lot of pre- sorry. I think there's for this for this monster play team. Mm-hmm. I think it's still only the second game of the year, and I think there's Joey Carberry is probably the guy who hasn't clicked yet. Um, I'm just glad that he's played two games in a row and he has no injuries. He's starting to get a little bit of consistency from him. He's doing very, very little wrong, but not doing anything that we're used to Joey from Joey Carberry. And I think there's a balance between what Munster need to achieve this season. And for the first time in a long time, we've said, I can't believe people would actually be complaining about it, that we saw Munster pack bully another team. Mm. Like that is, if you go down and talk to the, the like the, the faithful, you talk about Munster DNA, that's what it's about, a tight five dominance. And look how well they played once they established that tight, tight five dominance. Now, they did score the tries through the through the back, but like the least path of resistance and all that, there was still an awful lot to be um, impressed by, particularly the offloading game. I think uh, Gavin Coombs, for me, is, is a really important player for Munster. And a couple of his uh, offloads really changed the tempo of the monster attack a couple of his carries again changed the direction of their attack mm. he's one of the few like he is like he is so important to everything that monster are doing at the moment and he was part of that because he, he actually had a fairly poor opening 30 minutes but he came back into it in the last 10 but his second half was he was absolutely as outstanding um so i think there's um and there's the high press that the Stormers play, it can be very, very stifling. And I think for the Irish players, they're going to have to get used to that about how they unpick these defences and how they get, uh, and how they get in behind them. So they're not reliant on the uh, on the on the pack. I think that's probably why Joey Carberry's been so quiet because he's had two um, he's had two two weeks back to back where he's just had you know back rows and uh, things shooting up at him, mm. and he and he's had to be patient. Um, but I think once they find that balance, and once they have a few more players coming back, and the Atlantic coming back, Chris Farrell coming back, there's an awful lot to be excited about with this monster team. Fair enough, because that, that's a far more positive slant. Because I was sort of uh, thinking along the lines of Keane as well that they won't be able to bully a bigger team in Europe the way they did on Saturday. That they'll need a bit more craft. And and to be well, fair, I think you've got to you've yeah. got to realize they are big though. When you are look, w- like so when you go, right, like okay. you've got now you've got R.G. Snyman, you've got um, Klein, you've got the other Safa guy there, and you've got Ty Byrne to come back in, Jack O'Donnell. Like that's a big pack. So, I like I don't think you know. There's you know you look at um, you look at uh, La Rochelle and these things, and they have one or two big like Munster have that. Like Gavin Coombs is able to mix it, was able to mix it with any of the South African counterparts. So they do have a pack that can potentially do that. You don't want it to be your your only, and that's where the that's the I think that's the the bit that we need to understand and we need to see from Munster is the coaching up to getting them more than just a one trick pony because if they don't have any more guile and they don't have any more uh, subtlety than just you know relying on Simon and Klein to smash things they are in trouble but I am given some of the some of the passing in the wider channels particularly Peter Omani being and Jack O'Donoghue linking rather than looking for contact that leaves me you know very optimistic with this group okay Fair enough. That's interesting because I, I suppose, Keen, part of the problem for Munster in the early season is they almost can't win because they don't have the credit in the bank that Leinster have. Like we'll probably get on to Leinster and Rodney Parade, and it's like just, a, it's just a mess. You know, it's just one of those days. They have so much credit in the bank, though, there won't be an overreaction to that. If Munster had put in that performance at Rodney Parade, Van Graan would be coming under huge pressure. So it is interesting to hear Gordon there play up some of the positives that he is seeing. 
Yeah, but like the, the thing about it is as well, I think back to how Munster started last season and the quality of rugby was incredible, but they kind of retreated into their shells as the season went on and when it came to the crunch, the kind of rugby they were playing at the start of the season was nowhere to be seen. Now this, I think, has been a little bit different at the start of the season. I think Gordon is right to highlight Joey Carberry. I think he's still working his way back to to full fitness and I suppose it's it's probably more of a mental thing like you know he, he's had such a long time out of the game in terms of physically but I wonder mentally obviously Gordon would be better placed to to comment on that but how long it takes to actually get back to where he needs to be to me it seems like opposition teams are really targeting him in defence um, he's fallen off a few tackles in the first two weeks and I think that is a little bit of a concern because you know We've seen Joey Carberry pick up injuries in the past from, you know, because it's true, no fault of his own. Like he's brave to a fault almost. Like he'll always put himself in the way, but those tackles just aren't quite sticking. So I think that's something that Munster are really going to need to need to sort out going forward. I think, you know, it's great to see the younger players, I think, really stepping up at the start of the season. Gavin Coombs has really picked up where he left off last season. I think someone like Craig Casey, you know, is really making the most of Connor Murray's kind of delayed return after the Lions tour. I think someone like, you know, Gordon's talking about the size of the pack. I think a lot of the time in the last couple of years where they've been a little bit short, in my opinion, is maybe in the front row. Um, I think particularly, you know, at a tight head. And I think, you know, Keenan Knox now is, is really breaking through. He didn't have it all his own way last weekend, but he's a big, powerful um, young South African who's been over here for a few years now. But he's the type of player I think that Munster need to, to break through to help them. He's not an orgy snime and a ready-made guy who's going to help you in, in the morning, you know, win a Heineken Cup. Mm. But I really think in the next couple of years, he's the kind of guy that Munster need to be looking to to break through. So I don't know, because like I'm watching the first half, Gordon, and all I'm seeing from Munster is uh, Casey kicking the ball from his own half. They're not keeping possession. They're posing no threat. They're, it's one-off runners. Stormers, plenty of energy. I mean, second half, Stormers have a sin bin, which doesn't help them, but Stormers full of energy. They're able to handle what Munster are throwing at them. And I'm kind of thinking, this is really average. I don't really see what they're trying to do. The one moment they actually posed a bit of a threat was when they took a bit of a gamble with a few passes and they got up the left-hand side. And I think the try was disallowed. Peter O'Mahony was like a third-man latch. But like, uh, fair enough. I take all your points about packs bigger and it'll compete at European level. I still look at that first half when the Stormers had that bit of energy about them and were really in the game. And you would just still say Munster lack a bit of craft. Like the same way they just couldn't hurt Leinster in the final of last year's competition. You would say, is it really improving dramatically? That'd be the the, the nagging worry still with Munster. Yeah, and I think like it's dangerous to just look at a portion of the game. And I, th- I think actually, and Joe, I'll probably go back to what you said. They don't have credit in the bank. Mm. So you kind of answered your own question because they did ultimately go on, win the game, and win the game quite comfortably and began to almost purr in the second half. Yeah. So they don't have that. What you have there is we have that nagging sense of, oh, is this, this feels an awful lot like last season where, you know, flattering to deceive. So they have to earn it and they're going to earn it. They're going to have to earn it the hard way. And there's no other, there's no other way around it because they don't have, I'm going to say credit in the bank for the third time in one sentence. So they just don't have it. Yeah. Um, So they have to earn it. And every time they don't, execute well out of their half every time their line out malfunctions every somebody's going to go oh until they ultimately win but like if you can still win and play poorly um for me and again i'm going to go back to gavin coombs that his ability to suck up a really poor first third not let it damage his performance and come back and ultimately be one of the key guys changer you know one of the key uh leaders on the field for the other 60 minutes or you know, 50 minutes. I think that's re- that's really good for me. And same with Casey. The guys, they're going, so they're not firing, but they're able to play their way back into into the game. So to me, that's really good from an individual piece. It's the broader collective piece where we're talking and we're saying that we they need to be a little bit more needs to be a little bit more to them. Mm. There's going to be sterner tests ahead, and they won't get that. But they're, I suppose, when you when you get to those clutch matches. If you're winning along the way, that sense of belief in what the coaches have been doing over the preseason, as long as it's not defaulting back to doing box kicks as your opening salvo, 
um, I think there will be a, 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 they'll take an awful lot of confidence from that and then once they get that first clutch win in the season that's when things can really change among the group but that's you know th- there is going to be it's not going to be a season defining one but it's going to be a fairly uh, pressure game in the next four or five games Gordon do you anticipate we're going to see more Keith Earls in midfield? No <laughs> I'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> I, listen, Erzy is Erzy, like just he just launched his uh, he just launched his coffee uh, company there. If anyone doesn't know, it's a uh, eleven fourteen uh, coffee roasters. Um, he is a phenomenal winger, and he is like I, I can't see him. I can see him playing matches like this, where you know his where if they're short he can he can slot in but I like his value is his value is on the is in the is in the wing and I know that they're crowded back there but I don't think you're going into um I don't think you're going into a into a match without Delande and Farrell in the in the center and Earls on one of the wings yeah Scarlet's away on Sunday they've Connacht at home in week four Osprey's away week five and then they'll break off for the November internationals Keen people might be interested. I don't know if there's any word on the investigation into the alleged bite and Niall Scannell. The referee, to be fair, looked at it in real time when Peter Manny came over and said, you can see the bite mark footage was definitely inconclusive. I doubt they're going to unearth some conclusive footage. So I'd say that one will just drift out to sea or what are you hearing? Yeah, well, it's all it's all been quiet today, George, like trying to find out information. But I mean, I think the one thing you'd say is you would very rarely see a player accuse another player of something so serious if there wasn't in it. But I suppose if the footage isn't there now, I don't know if there's other angles that the TMO, our deciding commissioner, rather, will have access to that we didn't see on TV, perhaps. But it's obviously a very serious allegation. It probably soured the, the game a little bit. Yeah. Gordon, not much you can add to that specific incident. Was it a trend which had pretty much died out of your uh, rugby experience as your career progressed, or is it happening more frequently than I might suspect? No, it's not like, I, to be honest, it's one of those things that never really happened. Um, there's plenty of other stuff that happens, mm. um, but biting just didn't seem to be one of them. Um, like, I remember the last time, like Peter Classy. Um, he had a he had an interesting one playing for playing for Munster, but um, like the French guys would all be sticking fingers in your eyes with DPs on it and going for between your legs with DPs and stuff and and grabbing and yanking and uh, stuff. But biting just seemed to be one of those things that was never really done. Um, so yeah, it is. It's kind of yeah. It just it's really like it's just really dirty, isn't it? It just leaves a really bad taste. Oh my god, I can't. I was going to leave that pun. Bad taste in the mouth. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, no. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, this either just draw it, like kill it or cure it. Either find something, ban him, or just move on at this stage. Keen, I think um, last of the weekend was it Rodney Parade Dragons against Leinster. I think most people anticipated uh, fairly comprehensive and easy Leinster win. In the end, it was Dragons six, Leinster seven. They didn't score after Max Deegan's try in the fourteenth minute. Few Leinster changes, but uh, still lots of internationals in there. Lots of big names. There was just uh, a sloppiness about Leinster in the Rook. There were handling errors, I think 22 turnovers to the Dragons 11, 22 Leinster turnovers to Dragons 11, errors in the line-out as well. Uh, Traditionally, Leinster have been very good at avoiding dropping down to opposition level. It's hard to know what was going on here. It's not something we see from them very often. No, it was a tough watch, Joe, to be honest. Um, It was pretty dire. I suppose like a Sunday afternoon in Rodney Parade, the rain coming down, it's not the most glamorous place to be. But at the same time, you know, maybe Leinster were a bit complacent. Um, You mentioned the 23 turnovers, 14 missed tackles, 11 penalties conceded, six lost lineouts. Like they're they're the kind of stats that are unheard of really from a Leinster point of view, no matter how many changes they make. And you know what, in a funny way, maybe it'll be a blessing in disguise if they had went there and, you know, put... 30, 40 points on the Dragons, what would Leo Cullen and Stuart Lancaster have gotten out of that? But maybe they will have learned a thing or two about a few of the players there because like, the Leinster environment is so competitive at the moment that if you're a young guy, if you're a guy coming back from injury, you have to take absolutely every opportunity that you get. So, I mean, no matter if it's in Newport on a Sunday afternoon, you know, there, there really is no excuses. Um, to be fair, the Dragons put like a, a bit of pressure on Leinster, but they were just so uncharacteristically sloppy, in particularly in the Dragons 22, you know, sloppy knock-ons, um, really disjointed. They had very little direction. 
Um, but yeah, like you know, the review I'm sure this morning was probably going to be an, an ugly affair. But like I said, maybe they Leinster in the long run will actually get more out of a really poor display like that. Look, they did get away with the win. Um, they'll they'll, they'll probably be. Um, seriously relieved. I mean, I thought the the end game really summed up how muddled Leinster were. Um, I think it was Kieran Frawley kicked the ball back with about five seconds left on the clock, kicked it back to Dragons, which gave them a chance to to come down the other end, and then the ball squirts loose. Dan Levy, for some strange reason, kicks the ball along the ground back to Hugo Keenan, who's under pressure. And you're talking like the clock is well in the red now. And then Gary Ringrose eventually gets the ball off the pitch. It was just, yeah, it was it was schoolboy stuff at times, but uh, not not what you're used to seeing from a Leinster point of view. OTB AM with Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved radio.